Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Good? Okay, I'm gonna hit the start button. What is going on, guys? And welcome to the Wednesday night live stream. We got Deratica in the chat, Death Mage, Fin Time, Aquarium Cabinet Solutions. What is going on, guys? I will just drop the Hangouts link if anyone wants to come join the live chat today. Pre prep the link so it even works right off the bat. So, today we're going to talk about kind of reef tank redundancy. A lot of tanks crash from, you know, stuff like an ATO getting stuck on or, you know, heater sticking on, that type of stuff. So, I figure it's kind of a good topic. I'm going out of town in 12 hours from now. So, even one thing that's on my mind is just make sure the tank's all good, make sure there's nothing that's going to crash or fail on the tank and cause issues down the road. So, it's kind of a good topic. Um, before, you know, like, I know Anna, cause you're saying you're down in Texas, like down Texas, like you guys had all the floods, one of the hurricanes, like there's all these type of things that can cause issues with your tank. And if you don't have, you know, kind of backups and fail safe is that's the kind of stuff that could potentially kill your tank. So it's stuff to kind of keep in mind. David Walker, what's going on? I got Bub in the chat, Harish, Woody's Wreath method. What's going on guys? Happy Wednesday. So for one of the biggest things I'd say that kills 90% of people's tanks is heater failure. If your heater sticks on, those little elements in there wear out, they do stick over time. And if that sticks, I mean, that could potentially fry your tank. So like one of the things that I've always done is if my tank wants a 200 watt heater, I'll put in two 100 watts. So if one of them sticks on, it's not gonna fry your tank. So that's kind of one big one that can go to make a big difference. Now, aside from that, there are certain things you can do, like adding a heater controller. And what that's going to do is you can use that heater controller either as a fail safe. So if your temperature controller or the heater ever sticks on, it will turn off your heater for it. it. Usually has like a relay or something inside of it that will physically cut power to it. Or the way I do it in my case is I use the controller to turn the heater on and off on its own. That way the built-in thermostat is kind of the backup for it. So that's how I've done mine. That's the thermostat I've ever used. It's less likely to fail. So that's kind of one of the big thing. Um, the next probably bigger thing I'm going to say that I've seen kill tanks is an auto top off sticking on or a solenoid not closing or somebody pipes up your RODI unit directly to your auto top off in your tank. You know, something happens and it's going to be dumping in tons of water all over the floor. I mean, your salinity is going to go to like nothing in face terms of a freshwater tank and that can be dangerous and take out a lot of stuff. Ozzy Ozzy, what's going on in the chat? We got Da Vinci, Harris, Ravencaw, what's going on guys? Okay, um, so when you're adding stuff to your reef tank, especially if you're not home all the time, I always try to think of ways of how can you have a backup? How can you have a second level of redundancy? Um, so we kind of talked about the heaters already, um, even with your auto top off. You can have your regular auto top off, but maybe you put a float valve after it. That way, if for whatever reason it sticks on, the float valve is going to cut off the water flow. And that's another kind of simple thing you can do, but always try and have at least two different levels of redundancies. Or if you want to get fancier, you can have a solenoid that, say, kicks it off if it, a leak detection happens. So that's kind of another big one. Um, lighting, that's another one. If you guys run T5s, or your bulbs burn out, or your, you know, metal halides, and your ballast burns out, you know, is your, your tank's probably going to be fine without light for a few days, but if you got it ordered online somewhere and it takes a while, then, you know, that could be more of an issue down the road. So a few different kind of things to consider there. Uh, another big one, um, check valves on return pumps. Uh, a lot of people put check valves and those can, if you get a snail in there, get little crustaceans over stuff. Uh, music is about loud. Let me turn that down. All right, I'll just kill the music for now. Um, so if you have a check valve stick open and your sump can't handle it, I mean, you're gonna get water over the floor and extended power outage. So another thing, if you're gonna use those type of things, you need to kind of make sure that there, you do maintenance on them. You got to make sure they work, you know, make sure your check valve has unions on. You can actually take it apart and clean it once in a while. Now, ideally you want to make sure your sump can just handle that water volume. So if you have a power outage, you know, your check valve fails, you got to make sure your sump can handle that water and it's not going to flood over onto your floor. Cause that's kind of a big one. And I've seen that happen, not, not personally, but I've seen it happen many times. Now with that, so make sure you can handle it. Uh, another thing too, if it's not just over your weirs, you also have water will backflow through your return nozzle. So make sure that's high enough, whatever the bottom of that return nozzle is likely where it's going to suck from. So another thing you can do is put in a siphon break. And what that is, is basically you drill a little hole into somewhere on the bottom of it or wherever where the water can come back out. That way the air will get sucked in and it will break the siphon. It'll stop it. 
Uh, <laughs> salt in the tank. Nasty Nemo, what's going on? Kyle Murphy, welcome. Hello from Canada. You have great videos. Thank you very much, Kyle. Much appreciated. David Walker from the UK. Got the worldwide going on. I'm just going to drop the link again. I'm kind of rambling on. Uh, a couple people in the Hangouts, but if you guys have any points you want to bring up, feel free to jump in all the time. Um, so with that, doing a siphon break is kind of a big one. If your return nozzles are low in your tank, you want to make sure that it's not going to overflow or sorry, it's not going to keep siphoning lower and lower, especially you have that bendable press tubing, whatever you call it in there. Cause then that stuff, I mean that you, that can be push your nozzle down really low and it's going to suck a lot lower than you expect. So a couple things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. So do, do. how's it going? What's going on, Claudius? Mark from St. Louis. What's going on, Mark? What's going on, Nasty Nemo? Uh, do, 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 do. What else have for a couple good ones? Um, so power outages is another big one, especially extended ones. I mean, short-term ones, not really a big deal. But if your power is going to be out for a day or two, that can really cause trouble. What's going on, Ash? So for that, um, on mine, I have a completely overkill battery backup on my tank, which is hooked up to my return pump and my power heads. But at the very least, you know, if you can use like an inverter and a car battery, or if you have, you know, like a Vortec, they make their own. I did a DIY one for my MP40 powerheads. My opinion, what's going on? Welcome. Hey, Ash. So with that, I mean, it's pretty easy to make a DIY one for a lot of these pumps. And that could be the difference of, you know, your tank being saved versus crashing. Now on that note, um, so there's commercial ones. DIY really isn't that hard at all. Uh, Dev question about adding a PM1 to the Apex. Do you have to have a separate EB8 or can I connect it to an existing? You can connect it to an existing one. PM1 is just a module. All you need is an aqua bus, basically a USB 8A cable, and you just plug it in anywhere on the line off of it and it will work. So you can use that to add an extra one. Uh, nasty Nemo, we use a generator. Yeah. So if you've got a generator, I mean, you can run your tank until you run out of gas. So that is always a good way to go. Um, I went for the giant overkill battery mainly because I got the battery for free, but it can probably run my tank for, or my flow for about five days. Um, heaters, I don't bother putting a battery back up because if the tank very slowly cools a bit, it's not the end of the world, but if there's no flow, AKA no oxygen, that's, what's really going to kind of cook your tank at a certain point in time. So I think for me personally, flow is by far the biggest thing you can add to your tank. Even one power head on a battery could be, you know, the difference is saving your tank in an extended power outage. I've heard of some people, you know, over 24 hours and you know, stuff starts biting the dust. Now, if you don't have that, I mean, battery operated air pump, you can buy those for like 12 bucks off Amazon with a couple like C or D batteries. You can put one of those in there just to provide the oxygenation in the water. It can go a long ways. And I found it get a bit fancier. There's also ones you can get that have, um, you plug it in as well as batteries. So it kind of has like a relay in it. So it'll fail over two batteries if the power goes out. So it only turns on when the power is off. So that's kind of another kind of funky way that you guys can do it. And I haven't used one of those. I do have a battery one. I've never actually used it. I think I bought two just in case and they've never, ever been used. Now, when you want to step it up or kind of take another level, um, GFCIs, so it could be a breaker, could be the plug, but if something leaks in your tank, basically it's the safety so you don't cause a fire in your house, right? If water gets on the outlet, it's going to basically pop a breaker and then it's going to kill power to that. So I've heard of some people not using them on tanks because they think it's going to pop, the tank's going to die. I've had one for the last few years, never had an issue with it. If you really want to be crazy, I've, I've also seen people take it to another level where they have two separate circuits running for the tank and they have you know, half your pumps on one and half the pumps on the other. So if one breaker or something tripped, your tank's still running fine. So another kind of crazy, I'm still debating this one, but when I do my little kind of mini upgrade here, I was debating adding a second return pump. Completely overkill, but if one dies, you still got a second pump running your tank. Wouldn't miss a beat. Or you could do funky stuff like alternating the pumps and, you know, mixing up the flow. So a couple of random things I've kind of debated over time. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So what's going on, guys, in the chat? What's going on, Cruz? What's going on, Nick? Do you guys... I know I'm kind of rambling all over the... Pl Excellent, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Excellent. So... I'm kind of curious from you guys, would you guys run for kind of redundancies or backups or fail safes or any stuff you've implemented in your guys' tanks? Um, dual return pumps instead of one big one. Yep. Have you, does that work pretty well for you? Cause that's one of the big things I've been playing with trying to do for the next one. And it also uh, allows you to actually get better flow from, uh, you know, like say you have a uh, two return mm -hmm. uh, on either side of the tank, well, like the wide tank, you can actually push from both sides. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. No, that's very true. Um, someone in the chat, they're saying, 
was smart things. Let us know if you have a leak or a power cut. No, that's pretty awesome. I have actually one of the smart things too. I just used to control a couple lights, but the leak sensor is actually a great kind of add-on to put on. And if you guys want a cheap controller too, you could use, you know, like a little smart things hub. I think I bought mine for like 50 bucks on sale. It was cheap. And then you could, you know, have a couple outlets and, it, you know, maybe it cuts power to your pump if it senses a leak or something like that. So there's all kinds of kind of cool ways you could do it. It's like a budget controller as well. Yep. So, Another one is uh, having multiple skimmers on mm -hmm. a large system mm -hmm. instead of one large one again. Yep. So going back to the whole redundancy, I'd rather have two smaller size skimmers that are common. Mm -hmm. and easy to find and replace like the pumps and stuff yep makes it a lot easier to buy and typically it's a lot cheaper too no that's very true when you have two skimmers um i guess they both just kind of do their job it doesn't really make a difference and i've never tried running dual skimmers on my system you probably really yeah, up here how big your system is on that one i think mm -hmm. you know if you got a bigger system then yeah definitely Yep. It's going to help you out. Mm -hmm. uh, so David G is saying temperature regulator. I honestly think that's probably one of the biggest things that someone should have on there is just having that extra backup so your heaters don't cook your tank. Because that, to me, that goes a long way. Especially one of the more common ones. Yeah. Um, I Because I live in Houston, like you mentioned earlier, uh, placement of my tank within my home is probably the biggest factor for its survival. Um, because of the, the way my house is set up, I wanted it near a door that opens. Mm-hmm. Um, cause a lot of the rooms in my house are kind of smaller. Yeah. Um, and I don't want it in an area. I want there to be enough gas exchange with the outside world, mm -hmm. um, for the CO2. So I placed it in an area where, you know, there's a door that opens all day long. And then I also wanted it so that, um, I didn't want it upstairs because hauling water up and down is a big <laughs> issue. Yep. Um, also in the, in the instance of an emergency, I wanted to be able to get it out of the house quickly, but also um, I wanted to be able to, um, uh, like, if the if the power went out, mm -hmm. and which often the power goes out in the summertime, mm -hmm. and it can get 110 degrees in here. That's toasty. There's like, exactly. That would cook my tank. So I put it on the bottom floor area where even if it gets that hot, I can open the door. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so for me... Exactly. Well, yep. so that's the other thing is I have a generator mm -hmm. too. So nice. Well, that goes quite a long ways. Another thing too, um, what you're just saying, like overheating. Um, I haven't had that issue yet, but I have like I put like a 240 mil computer fan on the side of my sump. So if it ever gets too hot, it could turn the turn the fan on, right? You could you know say turn off your lights or turn off non-essential equipment to put less heat into your tank, and then you know a couple fans blowing across the water is going to increase evaporation and really help cool it down. Um, has... I mean, in in the instance of a storm out in nature, um, they can go a few days without light, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, so I would think that your lights would be the least. I mean, because lights pull a ton of power, correct? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, so I would think like um, if you lose power and you're running a generator, just turn off your lights for a few days if if that's what you have to sacrifice. No, I, I agree with you on that one. Honestly, the if you could only run one thing, having a powerhead running in the tank, number one biggest thing. Because that water movement is going to promote gas exchange, which is bringing oxygen to your fish and your corals. And without that, or I mean, yeah, or an air pump. And an air pump. Yeah, yep. and or an air pump, exactly. Um, ha having that oxygen there is like by far biggest thing. So for um, one, one idea I thought about, mm -hmm. like, would it be, this is really weird and this is only cause I live in Houston. Um, would it be advantageous to have RDI water frozen into cubes in the instance of an emergency? Like if you had no way to chill your tank outside of putting like a couple of tiny cubes of RDI water in it, mm -hmm. like, and I'm talking like super emergency, like it's 110, your tank, the heat is rising and there's no way to chill your tank outside of that. Um, yeah, hundred percent. That would work. Um, I okay. have, sorry, my dog's getting a little excited out there. Um, so like, I mean, just put them in a bag in the back of the freezer and yep. that's just like a last resort. Uh, I've even seen people too, just like a pop bottle is full of ice to something that's ice to fill it. But RODI ice cubes, I mean, you're counting for evaporation too. So two birds with one stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great way to do it. I have, um, at least where I am, like, we don't get that hot here, so I've never had to worry about the heat side of things, but I know a lot of people, you know, especially people running, like, metal headlights and these hot lights, it's, little things can make a big difference for heat on a tank. Especially, I mean, down in Texas, you guys probably have a lot more issues 
than I do up on the West Coast here, but yeah, frozen water bottles. Um, but yeah, if it is for auto top off too, I mean, ice cubes is a good way to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. You know what's mm -hmm. also good? What? Is uh, having a uh, having a metal tube uh, run from your tap because uh, typically you don't run out of water, and the water coming in is already at fifty five degrees. Ah. Would there be an, a metal tube? Would there be any issues having the metal in your tank? Not for a brief time. Yeah, that's true. On a semi-unrelated note, kind of, sort of, I've also seen people use, um, not metal, but use PEC tubes in their sump as a way of heating their tank for running, like, your hot water through it and stuff. And you could use that as kind of something you're already paying for in your house, right? You're already paying for, if you have gas anyways, if you have a gas one, that's running through in, yeah, in a water heater. And you could use that for kind of a way of, you know, more or less getting free heat on a small tank. It doesn't make much sense, but as you get a big system, I mean, it could really save you money that way. So yeah, that's a great idea for cooling though, using your water running through a tube. Uh, Cruz's audio is very low, I know. Speak up, Cruz. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I have a slider, I kind of play with it a bit to see who's talking. Cruz is quieter, some of the other people are louder, so gotta balance it all out. Um, yeah, so uh, during Hurricane Irma, got extremely hot, no power for three days for us. So keeping the tank cool is my main concern. Water bottles and a generator, yep. <laughs> Uh, tank yep. is up to 83, nothing, uh, uh, ocean floor pulled out, uh, let's look at that. But yeah, honestly, um, if you guys don't have a generator backup battery, like, you know, an old car battery, that on a little, a cheap power inverter just to run like an air pump, can go with that. But honestly, you can buy a, a battery air pump for like 10, 12 bucks off Amazon and get a couple D batteries and that baby will go for a day or two. So that's probably one yep. of your easiest ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it not only, it not only uh, gives you the aeration that you need, but it also does uh, minimal circulation. Do you know what I'm saying? With the updraft mm -hmm. of the bubbles in the tank. Yep. So if you strategically place the bubbles, like say along the backside of your tank, mm -hmm. Um, you're actually going to get that turnover, kind of like a gyre, but very, very slow. Do yep. you know what I'm saying? It's yep. still circulating the water. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Another another thing that, um, like, regarding the hurricane, again, and I know this might not, uh, this, a lot of people probably don't think about this, but um, before the hurricane, like out here with Harvey and, like, Irma, mm -hmm. um, they tell you to, like, fill your bathtubs with water. Mm -hmm. well, another good thing would be, like, to start filling the five-gallon jugs with ROD. I mm -hmm. water because you you may live in an area where the pipes bust and where you're not going to have wow. clean water and you're not or you might not have running water mm -hmm. um so have a bunch of backup rodi water because even if you have to drink it that's you know so oh no that's, yeah, that's a lot of things a lot of things people don't think of because they don't live in an area where it floods frequently exactly that's a great point um on that note I have overflowed my RODI in it many times in the past, and I finally learned to put a float valve on it. So, so now, I, everything, all my little top-off jugs, any of my brute cans, anything, I have float valves on it. And that is a big, big, big thing that everyone should do. Because it's very easy to start filling a jug and walk away and forget about it and walk on the floor and squish, squish, right? So that's, yeah. So I literally have one on everything, even like my nano tank, like there's a drill hold and I ordered one off Amazon when it comes, I'm popping in another float valve in there. So I plug, when I fill my jugs, I take, I put a 50 foot RODI line off my unit and I literally just walk it from the closet out around the house and plug it into my top off containers and I just let it fill. And then whenever it's full, I the little bobber will stop it if I'm not paying attention. You don't have to worry about anything flooding. But yeah, float valves, huge, 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 huge. Like everyone should do that. <laughs> Oh, yep. yep. Uh, Bubba just had a great point. Um, I even have a bottle of hydrogen peroxide for extreme emergencies. Um, so hydrogen peroxide, yep. ox... I was just going to say that yep. one. Yeah. Yep. So... I was just going to say that, Deb, about the hydrogen peroxide. It's something I haven't looked at before. Mm -hmm. So if you ever put H hydrogen peroxide H2O2, if you spray that in the water, you'll instantly see it turn to bubbles. Um, I've used it for killing algae spot trading but yeah it will actually create little oxygen bubbles in the water so that I means for a backup plan you could literally dose that in every once in a while and that will add oxygen as well you think um, they, uh, another one um, yeah reactors as well with that so you can actually they use uh, potatoes as a catalyst yeah but you know, reactor in, in the system like. and it'll continuously dose i've heard about that I've never tried it so what do you do yeah yeah we put uh chunk of potatoes into a bottle yeah into a two liter bottle mm-hmm 
and then we pour hydrogen peroxide in mm. an entire bottle and yep. let it bubble. And how long does that bubble for? Yeah, the catalase on the potato actually breaks down the hydrogen peroxide hmm. into water and oxygen. Really? So you're constantly dosing it. Ah, oh, that's, yep. that's a cool way to do it. That's another way that you can maintain way, your pH yeah. if you suffer from low pH. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That way you're not killing off your bacteria if you dose too much. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Good to know. Now, would you just pump the output of the gassing into the water, or would you let it drip into the water? How it would you do up, that? It builds up pressure. Okay. It does build up pressure. So basically, you so, need a cap with a little line off of it to your, huh, into the water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little uh, a little nub, one of the airline uh, barbs. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Very cool. Good to know. If you haven't looked at it, though, if you can actually buy um, a reactor kit as a, as a kit form, so you can buy that and then put it straight in. I think I actually uh, have... For the manufacturer. Yeah, I think I actually have these little caps with dual airline little nubs on the top that you can screw into a mm -hmm. bottle. I think they're for DIY CO2 or something, but I ordered them a long time ago right. just for random DIY projects. Yep. Right. And if you scuba dive, like a lot of uh, reefers, you know, that are close to the coast and whatnot... Mm -hmm or that are avid divers, you could actually turn your scuba tank into a uh, backup uh, air generator as well. Oh, very good call. I've, I've actually had friends do that before. Yeah, with, mm -hmm. yeah, with their aquariums. Yeah, huh. use, okay. yeah use their um, their tanks. Yeah, we cheat. 75, 75 25 oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> you like a little oxygen boost? Um, no, that's a great idea, yeah. actually. Yep. I dive, but I've never bothered buying tanks because it's always somewhere tropical when I go. So it's just. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a good call. Um, um, and I know that a lot of people also have paintball, the compressed mm -hmm. air. Yep. You I could also utilize that. that as a <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What? I was just going to say that as well. You can use the, the compressed air uh, cylinders for the paintball guns. <laughs> you don't want to like a big cylinder. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true. I can get off the stream. You, don't, you guys don't need me here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And with those, uh, with those higher pressure systems, you should be able to utilize the ceramic diffusers mm -hmm. for the CO2 for a planet tank as well. Yep. You just have to put on the regulator. Either that or even just like what we use for microwaveling, just those little wooden air stones. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you can do that. You'd probably pop one of those on a battery operated pump and get tons of oxygenation from that. Amen. Yep, exactly. What's going on, Mr. Michael? Phone hasn't died yet. <laughs> Phone's died. Phone's oh, died. Oh, one, you made it home? Yeah, one of the other uh, things. Or, or if you're. Oh. Sorry. Oh, go, go, no, go, go. No, I, was gonna, go. I, I was actually going to make a joke. I was going to say, or if you're um, Nick, you could just take a straw and blow bubbles into your aquarium. Yeah. <laughs> probably, that's probably how he would do it. Yeah. Oh, Nick is still telling everyone. Like, that only works in a planet. That's a secret. He <laughs> there is um, On the note of actually blowing bubbles, other than physically doing it, taking like a bucket or something and just taking water out and dumping it in once in a while too, just that surface agitation. And forcing the water is going to catch mm -hmm. air into it, and it's going to help do it as well. <laughs> Borrow your poor grandma's yep. oxygen tank. Oh, lordy. <laughs> <sighs> That's awesome. But yeah, no, and honestly... Also, okay, go ahead, Chris. Oh, go ahead. Nope, sorry, all you. I said um, also, um, in regards to the uh, you know regular bubbling, mm -hmm. the oxygen level in your tank is a lot higher. Than, uh, than most people's systems that are just sucking in the air, you know, to their skimmer from uh, underneath their sumps. Yep. So during a power outage, you're, you know, the ones that have been bubbling and have a higher oxygen content and dissolved oxygen content in their water mm -hmm. will actually be able to last a lot longer than those that don't. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's true. Um, not yeah. not necessarily, I mean, as redundancy, but pulling air in from outside, too, is going to make a huge jump on your pH versus just doing inside room. Or opening a window. I mean, anything you can use so you're not just sucking in the recycled air from your room. All right. Now, on the whole redundancy and kind of fail-safe side of things, uh, overflows. Yep. A lot of people I see only have that single overflow tube, and to me, that seems very sketchy. Because if for some you reason, mean like the Herbie? yes, like the Herbie? yeah, Herbies are not safe. If every anything ever plugs clogs that tube, you know, so, or like an LG sheet gets sucked in, like anything really. I mean, your water's got nowhere to go, and it's gonna overflow. So I, I'm a big, huge fan of the bean animals because I have a partial siphon or a full siphon. I also have a partial siphon, and then I have a third overflow that's just dried. It's like a complete backup. 
So the open channel, if it ever folds up with air, or sorry, if the air completely covers it, it's completely submerged, it's going to turn a full siphon and drain really quickly. And if for some reason that somehow two of those got blocked, and there's a third one that will take any overflow. That's always dry. There's never anything potential to build up in it. So I think huge fan of the bean animal triple kind of overflows. And I also have a partial siphon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, so how are you curious? What about, do you guys have any other kind of elegance curl secrets or backup stuff that you guys do? Yeah, I have a big wooden spoon. Yeah, you just, just, my, um, circulation <laughs> pump break, so yeah, when it comes down to yeah. cooling, you know, just cooling, mm -hmm. um, you know, we always have a, um, you know, USB powered fans, mm -hmm. uh, battery powered fans, and we have, uh, what we call a step trickle. Yep. So all we need is a small pump and we blow air across the step trickle mm -hmm. and basically what it does is it acts as a cooling tower hmm. so sense. once again the whole aeration but increasing the surface area yep for better cooling you just gave me an excellent idea um it, this may be what you're talking about um so some of the old older kind of upflow filters they basically had an air pump inside of a tube and the air bubbles would rise water up the tube and it would spill back over just like a little spout. So you could literally use that to double as putting air in as well as cooling it by letting it waterfall back into the tank. Right. Mm -hmm. That'd be actually, that'd probably be pretty handy for a power outage. I might build one for fun one day, just, just for the sake of it, <laughs> just for the experiment. But yeah, I think that'd actually work really well because it kind of give you evaporation, evaporative cooling plus oxygen at the same time. Yep. Could be good. Two birds, one stone. Exactly. Um, but yeah, honestly, biggest thing for, for me though, battery backup on a power head is the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and you only somebody... put the, oh, go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry. We keep talking at the same time. Somebody last night had mentioned there's a pretty inexpensive battery for the, for the ice cap that I could get, um, specifically, like it's specifically for the ice cap, yep. um, that'll run it for quite a while. Um, if you put it on the lowest, like the like the 30% setting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get one of those just in the off chance because um, I think it's like a hundred bucks. Yep. So, the APC, um, the APC yeah, or yeah. the ice cap? The ice cap branded one. The Yeah, the ice cap branded one. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's like a hundred bucks. So um, it, I mean, I figure insurance, like worst case scenario, my power does go out this summer. Mm -hmm. I, I've got, you know, enough time to to let it run because usually the power in my area if it does go out it's it's not going to be for more than like 12 hours and that's a worst case scenario yeah exactly i mean 90 percent of us we don't have super long power outages it's usually a couple hours and things are back up it's not the end of the world so even a small battery is enough to keep things going um with the ice cap and the j j j bells j bows j cods i don't know all the same um most of them i believe they run at 24 volts for that so a lot of those, some of them, you can run them at 12 volts and they'll just run at slower speed. It's all good. Um, some of the pumps you actually do need to do, run it at 12 volts. So if you want a DIY one, I mean, it's very easy to do. I mean, you just put two batteries in series or just if it's 12 volts, you literally just hook it up to a battery and just all you need is a connector to plug it in. Now with them, like another kind of thing to consider, like my Ecotech one, I bought a little battery booster pack for it was like 20 bucks or something. So it, it raises it from 12 volts to 24 volts. So I have that plugged in. So if my power ever goes out, it auto kicks over to that. That's one thing I like with the Ecotech stuff is they have um, the controllers have a battery backup port on it. So you don't even need to bugger with that. You can literally just plug into a battery and it jumps over on its own when it bites the dust or your power kicks out. What's going on, Melanie? What's going on, Claudius? So that can kind of go away. So it's pretty easy to build a DIY battery backup. I would really recommend it, even if you're not technical, it's not that hard to do. Or, yeah, I mean, you can buy commercial ones. They're not, you, most of them aren't too bad, a little hundred bucks, hundred something bucks. But just that on a power head can 100% go a long way to saving your tank. Yeah. It's a lot cheaper than replacing fish and coral. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and just the stress mm -hmm. when your power does go out, sitting there, like, trying to figure out how to swish around your yep. water and... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, a couple of things. Um, I'm just curious for you guys. Do any of you guys keep up spare stuff on hand? Like, do you have an extra heater kicking around or an extra return pump if yours was to die? Or is it panic, go to the fish store and go buy one? I have an extra power have head. A, um, yeah. Go ahead. 
No, I just have one extra power head. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I've only been in the hobby for less than two months. Yeah, so that's fair. As I as I upgrade things, mm -hmm. um, I'm going because I bought an established tank. So I so like I bought a, a gyro, the what the ice cap. Sorry, yeah. I bought the ice cap. So the old power head that I bought when I got my tank, I still have. And so as I upgrade, like I just bought a new pump, um, that is probably. I just have a cheap little crappy one because I was going to make my own bio pellet reactor reactor. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so this will probably be sitting around. It will work better than nothing at all. Oh, yep. Exactly. Um, in a pinch, like mm -hmm. if I need it until my Amazon order shows up, but yep. so I have stuff like this, but mm -hmm. you know, um, worst case scenario, I have enough friends in the hobby now that I've met locally that if I needed an extra heater or something, I, I wouldn't, my tank wouldn't die. Yeah, you can go grab one from somebody and you're, you're covered. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd hit up Infamous Aquatics, be like, yeah. "Hey, dude." <laughs> yeah, I saw Ninja in the chat here somewhere. Yeah. Anthony, there's the there, there's the link if you want to jump on Ninja. You haven't been on the live stream in a while. <laughs> yeah. I, I have his phone number, so yeah. <laughs> or at least his girl. I have his I have his girlfriend's phone number, so I, I'd be hitting him up. <laughs> nice. I have his girlfriend's phone number as well, but he doesn't like, <laughs> doesn't like you calling her. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, no. Downhill fast. Um, okay. So uh, another thing to, to consider, I mean, some people will have their extra equipment just sitting in a box, not used. And then the other kind of mentality is to have two of all this on your tank. You know, you have two power heads, you have two heaters. You know, if you're stepping up a bit, you can have two return pumps. So if one dies, you still have a second functioning one because the likelihood of them both dying is pretty slim. But for one dying, I mean, eventually everything's going to fail, right? It might not be years, yeah. it might be five years, 10 years, who knows? It could be a week after, yeah. you know, okay, get it dead, who knows? But eventually stuff is going to fail. Yeah, yeah, one of the things that we also have on hand you know, as an emergency is, you know, if you do go through those days, you know, days without power and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and all you have is a generator, sometimes the lights, you know, some of the LED lights mm -hmm. on the market today yep. don't have an over... Oh, you totally so cut out there, Chris. Oh, sorry. Um, you know how uh, some of the LED lights do not have an overcurrent protection on them? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we always have, you know, like a spare light. Mm. Um, you know, one of the uh, Home Depot specials, the Sylvanias, yep. you know, the 5,000 Ks, it keeps your coral alive mm -hmm. without having to run, like, you know, super duper expensive or have, you know, one Radeon sitting in the, you know, sitting in the closet. Yeah, no, that's, that's um, a good you know, call. How long would you so, say a coral is okay without light before it starts to become an issue? Typically around seven. Okay, so about three days and any more than that, it starts to yeah. go downhill. Um, unless you lower the temperature um, to around 74, mm -hmm. you know, 72, 74 degrees, then you actually slow down the metabolism of your entire tank. Yeah. Which is also another way to actually, you know, keep your system, you know, not utilizing a, a lot of the oxygen or, um, you know, not really needing all that agitation. Mm -hmm. again. No, that's very true. And then depending where you're where you... in the inch so I was going to say, Go depending where you are, I mean, your tank could be getting cooler, could be getting hotter, depends on the time of the year and where you are. Yeah. See, um, up here in the north, you know, kind of like you does as well, mm -hmm. we have more power outages during the winter time. Yeah. You know, the, the rains, the snows, snow, ice, taking down power lines. Um, we get a lot of sleet. Uh, people crashing into power lines mm -hmm. or into power poles that yeah. take down the lines. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean... One of the hardest things that we have to face is how do you keep it warm? Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people, you know, they, they do freak out and they, you know, knee jerk react and they're like, oh my God, the, the power went out. Salt yeah. water does tend to hold heat really, mm -hmm. really well. Yeah. So, it, I mean, that's one way. Um, on that note, this is a bit of tip if you guys are transporting corals, just having a bag of salt water in there will go a long way of kind of heating it too. Cause yeah, it does retain heat very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've seen some people go as far in like colder climates where they put like insulation panels around their tank and all that stuff to kind of retain it. But I never, I am, um, I, sorry, I yep. kept the styrofoam boxes mm -hmm. that one of my, uh, 
fish stores gave me. And so um, when I know I'm going to be purchasing a bunch of smaller bags, mm -hmm. I just take that with me. Mm -hmm. And then I have them put it in that. And then it at least prevents like too much of a, too much of a, Swing. you know, change. Yeah. And then the, the other thing I do is I, in my car, I go ahead and crank up the heat. <laughs> um, Cause I know the water, I know if it, if it's warm, it's not going to be a big deal, but if it, if it gets too cold, it, it'll probably cause an issue. So. Yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. Um, salt water itself. I mean, same thing. You have like, you know, a bigger bag full of water versus, you know, a tiny little amount that's going to keep it stable a lot longer as well. Um, so John was just saying hurricanes here in Florida lost power last season. So how long do you lose it for three days, but some areas is a week. Yeah. So a week's a long time. I mean, yeah. Wow. yeah. So that right there, you know, having a decent battery backup on a power head could be the main thing to save it. Um, again, same with having water, right? Like if you have excess RODI for something happens, you know, or you're, you know, you're flooding, something's happening. You can still have, um, that stockpile. You have that big bin to kind of tie you over for a while. Um, I wonder if it wouldn't be a bad idea if people live in regions, like this is what I'm kind of thinking about doing people who live in regions where they know that they're at higher risk mm -hmm. of national disasters, maybe have friends that in, in a pinch, if like it floods, mm -hmm. you all have a plan to mm -hmm. trans. I know it sounds kind of stupid, but to transport like your high dollar corals all to somebody's house, <laughs> like if somebody has a bigger tank than what they need, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of consolidate. Yeah. And I know that that's going to increase the bio load, and you mm -hmm. know some fish might not be happy with other fish, but if you could, um, if like somebody doesn't hasn't lost their power, mm -hmm. maybe you could just kind of give them your corals for for a yeah. week or two at least until you get your power mm -hmm. back it at least be better than losing everything no exactly. that's how you uh, that's how you transfer red bugs <laughs> black bugs yeah and yeah i know <laughs> i know uh, and I, I know i know usually when you're in a disaster the last thing you're thinking about is your fish aquarium you're, mm -hmm. thinking, you're like looking for your ar-15 because people are trying to <laughs> like home invade and kill you <laughs> Stay away yeah, from my that's, corals. That's what we were dealing with here in Houston. Really? We were like, oh yeah. Yikes. Like we like all the husbands in our neighborhood were were like banding together to protect the neighborhood. It was, it was that crazy. bad. Wow, that's crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. But you know, <laughs> I didn't lose a fish aquarium. So didn't lose anything in the house? Yeah, no nope. bandits. That's nope. crazy. That's a whole nother level. Nope. Um, yeah. Houston's a weird city. Yeah. So uh, it's fun. <laughs> yep. Uh, my opinion, how long can a tank go without flow? Oh, good question. That is a good question. Cruz, what's without, your thoughts? <laughs> without flow? Yeah, how long would you say? Oh, uh, once again, it depends on the DO of your tank. It, yeah. That's um, that's one of the reasons why we always have a DO meter. Mm -hmm. You know, just a handheld DO meter mm -hmm. to, to take a look at it. If it dips below... If it dips below eight, you know, eight, uh, eight parts, mm -hmm. that's when we start, uh, you know, freaking out. Yeah. So but usually ours is around 12. Okay. So 12, uh, after bubbling. So most people do not have a DO meter and I'm going to say it depends. Mm -hmm. If you have a ton of fish that are expelling carbon dioxide, you're going to use up your oxygen levels quicker, right? If you have a very yep. understock tank and go a lot longer, uh, one way I kind of look at it, if you order online, you get a fish, you know, next day, they usually put pure oxygen in the bag though. Um, same with corals, you, you know, maybe you ship it overnight. So I'm going to blindly say, you know, eight to 12 hours and stuff might start going downhill after that, but it really depends on kind of what's same. in your tank. So that, that's kind of my blind guess up on it. Absolutely. Uh, but I mean, a lot of people are mistaking flow for oxygenation yeah Do you know what i'm saying dev yeah that's true flow Gas doesn't exchange. Generate yeah. The oxygen. yeah yeah so flow doesn't create oxygen or nor does it you know create okay. gas exchange okay so flow yeah. aka surface tension if your tank's making waves or the surface is all moving around the break in the surface mm -hmm. tension that's going to promote gas exchange and that's how water right. oxygen starts making its way into the water if it's perfectly right. still water you're not going to have it that's why having an air bubbler or having a power head, you know, even aiming at the surface, breaking the surface, all that surface tension. You gotta break the surface. Yeah. That's going to help push all those gases to the surface. It's going to interact with the air and then it's going to absorb more oxygen into the tank. That's kind of the one to go. Yep. Yep. Um, anyone lose any equipment in a thunderstorm? Okay. This is another, sorry, sorry. 
I can see Nicholas about the shock. Give me one second. Okay. So on that note, um, I have not. I also have a UPS on my tank, like in one of those little APC backup power supplies. Yeah. And I run my everything my tank runs through that. Some of it's just surge. Some of it's on battery backup. Now, I do this because there's power spikes and brownouts and stuff. You're not going to burn out your equipment. Seymour, if you're watching, I'm sorry, but I'm using an example. Seymour has went through so many power supplies for his pumps, lights, all kinds of stuff until he finally bought a UPS and now there's been none. So all those power surges, brownouts, all that stuff is what's going to kill your power supplies. So having a little yeah, battery definitely. backup on your tank can go a long way of keeping your equipment running. So another great preventative yeah. way. I had to throw one out there. Yeah, that's what I was talking about with, um, you know, a lot of the equipment in the hobby, in the aquarium hobby, they don't have what we call a surge protector or um, they don't have an overcurrent protector where it would actually kick out before it burns up any of the circuits. Yeah. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, so UPS is definitely the best way to go when you have uh, inconsistent power coming in. Yep, exactly. So so on the note, like we said, the thunderstorm, I mean, that the surge protector in there could save your lights from being overdriven, could save, you know, that power spike from killing your power supply. You know, if you have brownouts and mm -hmm. big dips in your power, it's going to kick on for that couple seconds to fill the void so that it's not being hard on all those circuits powering your equipment. So that's another great one, I think, you know, just like, I think I bought my second one I got for like 50 bucks used on like a classified site and it was like brand new. So, I mean, just keep an eye out for good deals and that stuff can go a long ways. Yep. Um, so someone's just asking what number should you have for DO, dissolved oxygen? So Cruz, you said less than eight is trouble and you said it's normally around 10 to 12, which you guys keep yours at? Yeah, we can keep it around 10 to 12. Okay. 10 to 12. I do not have one of these fancy probes, so I got nothing on that one. It's uh, only 166 bucks on uh, Amazon if you guys are very interested. Well, that's not bad. Yeah. So, not really fancy, not really expensive. Yeah, for some but, reason, I thought yeah, they were... When you have a, yeah, when you have a lot of corals and you have a lot of fish that are expensive and you have, like, tens of thousands of dollars invested in it, you kind of tend to, you know, keep an eye on every single freaking tank like that. Yeah. Do you have a handheld one? Sense? Or one with the controller? Yeah, yeah we have a handheld one. It's battery, battery driven. So yeah, pretty simple. Huh, Two hundred and sixty bucks is the cheapest one. Crazy. Um, it's the Milwaukee, the Milwaukee. Okay, I'm just Milwaukee uh, Do. Huh, there you go. Cool. I kind of, kind of wish I had had that today when I had my power outage, just so it was panicking. I knew things were all right, <laughs> but it was hard to panic. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you've also been bubbling for a while too, so. Mm -hmm. You're doing okay. <laughs> You've got time. You're stockpiling right. oxygen in your tank. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you have you have a tank of liquid oxygen. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing with a friend of mine. He goes, uh, "What was mad in the tank? Anything?" And I went, "Believe it or not, just my pipe organs. Everything else was That's perfectly fine." fine. Nice. Um, so I'm like, "Okay," and they're coming out now. It's been yep four hours, so they're starting mm -hmm. to come out now. So. Um, does, okay, so my opinion is asking, does DO mess with pH? I'm going to say yes, because CO2 in your water is kind of the opposite in a way, and more CO2 lowers pH. So less CO2, aka, and more oxygen is going to raise pH. So it does kind of correlate to it. Yeah, but it only raises it up to as far as alkalinity or the carbonates would actually let it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have been saying, oh my God, my freaking pH is going to run through the roof if... I bubble all night. And I'm like, no, it only goes up to the saturation point of your carbonates. Mm -hmm. If you if you understand water chemistry, there's a point where gas no longer can dissolve back into water, mm -hmm. and that's where it actually degasses the excess oxygen as well. So it, you won't get a runaway pH scenario mm -hmm. unless you're utilizing buffer, you know, the buffer mm -hmm. solutions, the pH up yep. and or you know, stuff like that. Or potentially, yeah, you know, it. using like pure compressed oxygen or something, which is not something that is normally done. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So regular aeration, you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. the oversaturation or supersaturation. Because once again, our tanks are not under pressure. Mm -hmm. They're not an enclosed uh, ecosystem. You know, they are exposed to air and regular atmospheric. So whatever is uh, excess to what the water can actually handle. Mm -hmm. It will tend to degas it. Yep. 
No, good call. Um, the other thing to consider too is where you're pulling your oxygen in from. If you're, you know, you have a small room with a bunch of pets in your family, you're you're putting a lot of CO2 back in there because that's what's in the air, right? If you're pulling it from outside source, like by a window or you have a little airline running outside, it's going to be much higher, much lower CO2 concentration, which is going to raise your pH higher. So that's one of the biggest things to raise your pH because most people have low pH issues is pulling outside air into say your skimmer or into your little air pump to bubble in the tank like that's by far the biggest way to raise your pH yeah, mm. yeah what did I say the other day crew 7.9 to 8.2 in three days yep that's from pulling it outside air yeah well you know what I uh, yeah. I had two hours a night and uh, no my air pump is just running from the dining room um, I was a little nice. surprised at that. So I'm guessing that's because nobody's ever in there. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Remember uh, CO2 does stratify. It is a very, very heavy gas. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're degassing your tank, you know, through the overflow into your sump chamber, you're degassing a lot of the CO2. If you run your skimmer air directly in from that sump area you're sucking all that co2 that's stratified in your sump system mm -hmm. or underneath the cabinet and you're sucking it back in and redissolving it into the water which is yep. one of the reasons why people do see that sag all you know all the mm -hmm. time you know they can't get it up above 7.9 yep. they can't get it up above 7.8 and they're you know they're wondering why the corals aren't growing i used to have so, that same issue before i ran my ultra tiny restrictive airline outside it was never above eight. It was like grazed eight on a good day. And now it's never below eight. So it makes, yeah. it makes a decent difference. Yeah. Mine's, uh, my, both my, uh, uh, skimmers run outside air. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And when I get a Tom's aqua lifter, mm -hmm. it'll tap into that line and it will run outside yeah. air. Okay. So <laughs> nice. So in the chat, John Guile, um, battery powered aerator is what I use for the hurricane season. Three days, everything survives. So there you go. That air pump running for three days saved your tank. So battery operated one, 10, 12 bucks. Everyone should own one. Have as a backup. I have two for whatever reason. I've never used them, but that having that option can go a long ways. You just said butter. And, uh, not only that, and not only that, but an air pump is a lot more efficient energy wise and mm -hmm. oxygenating in oxygenating and also circulating, yep. you know, creating a uh, flow mm -hmm. in your tank than a power head. Yep, exactly. I think... So it'll last longer in a power outage situation. I just thought of a new cool project. <laughs> um, so most most air pumps, this, this is probably going to be a future video now. Uh, so most air pumps, you know, you plug it in, but it probably just drops it down to fairly low voltage anyways. Yeah. So I Typically think... Typically 12. Yeah, so I'm thinking you could... You could really easily do a little relay so that it, once power it lost power from your AC power, just kicked over to a battery automatically. This might be a future video. Yeah. All right, stay and, tuned. Uh, Sometime in the next few months when I get bored one day. And what we do is we usually have um, at least one air source mm -hmm. in the display tank yep. and one in your sump. Don't mm -hmm. forget your sump. Yeah. It also needs oxygen too. Yep. And with all the chambers being divided with the baffles, you have to account for every single one of those baffles to go anaerobic if mm -hmm. you don't get any circulation or any. Okay. On that, thank you for a great point. Uh, anaerobic bile pellets can be dangerous. If you oh, no. are oh, in, if you are in an extended, <laughs> if you have an extended power outage and you use bile pellets, and speaking of anaerobic, all kinds of nasty stuff will build up in that bio pellet chamber. And when you kick your power on, you're releasing all these nasties back into your tank. And I've seen that almost kill or wreak havoc on tanks from extended power outages in bio pellets. So if anyone mm -hmm. does use bio pellets and have an extended power outage, I would highly recommend you dump all that water and put in fresh water before turning it back on. So Correct. I have never used bio pellets for those reasons. To me, they seem yeah. sketchy, so I've always avoided it. I've done other means of carbon dosing, like vinegar or vodka, whatnot. But yeah, bio pellets to me it still seem sketchy. So you know, uh, I always so hey Nick. yeah. Nick, <laughs> Nick beat him up. Now reaping with O said you guys are making me worried because I don't have a backup plan for anything. <laughs> reaping with O, oh God, really? don't get scared, get prepared. Exactly. See, perfect. <laughs> that, don't be scared. The whole oh. point of the whole point of this stream is for us to not to not freak out and for us to say, I can do it. 
exactly. No big deal. We got this. Yeah. I mean, this. a lot of these things are more extreme. Are they likely? Probably not. Could they happen? Yeah. So it's just little things, right? You know, like just from the very basics. If you need a 200 watt heater, buy two 100 watts instead. One sticks on, it's not going to kill your tank. One dies, the other one's still warm enough to sustain it. It's just all these little things add up, right? Um, with your auto top off, you have your regular one. Maybe, you know, um, there's a couple different companies, but they make a float valve with a little acrylic bracket. Put that on top of your float valve. If it ever gets stuck on for a second reason, you got that bobber to stop the flow so it doesn't flood your tank. Like there's all these little things where it just takes that extra little bit to kind of give that second level. What's going on, Rookie Reefer? Welcome. Uh, oh, just have a straw and a wooden spoon. That's your essentials. Th that's Nick's method. So, so Nick sits on yeah, his couch with a, a big straw, and, and he just sucks on it, and he falls asleep and just blows, and that's how he aerates his tank. <laughs> now he doesn't realize, but he's actually putting more CO two than oxygen in the tank. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> he's going into the Calor uh, the Calorpa and the uh, Cato area. Okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, so bio pellets if power outage. Bio pellets extended periods bad trouble. Dump that water out. Don't just turn them back on right away. So it's something to something to throw out there. <laughs> yep. I know. Yeah, we have uh, we have a shop light. You know, basically a cheap shop light for uh, the extended periods, so that we're not. Uh, you know, we're not relying only on our you know metal halides and stuff mm -hmm. like that. That's a high F draw. Um, you know, for our corals, um, gosh, what else? Circulation, aeration, lighting. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And oh yeah, don't be tempted to feed your fish during, you know, mm. during that time as well. They'll be fine. Yep. Great. You don't say. Great, great, <laughs> great point. Fish will be fine for a few days without food. If yeah. you are feeding them, all you're doing is adding more waste and toxins into your tank that are not being filtered out. So yeah, definitely put them on a diet during that power outage and feed them once you know everything's back on, back to normal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fought that urge today. Yep. <laughs> like I gotta go feed. Wait a minute. Right. <laughs> you know, you're so habit formed. Yeah. And even with the power yep. out, my, my brain just went right for okay, you, you gotta feed the fish, you gotta, you know, give exactly. a, go ahead. Do you have a power outage right now? Craig, or you no, did have I one? I went out today, uh, went out at 11.30 this morning, did not come back on until almost 4 o'clock. Mm. So, so, not yeah. a big one, mm -hmm. but a kind of the what we normally get. Yep. And so I have just minor stuff. I have battery-powered air pumps, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the stone, everything already hooked to them. Boom, they both are already set up to go in whichever tank. Mm -hmm. um, I have six D-cell batteries ready to rip. Nice. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm prepared if it's extended, right? Mm -hmm. um, but today was a weird one. It was cold. Ah. So it wasn't my normal winter ones. I don't really panic about mm -hmm. because usually the heat's on. Well, we're in that period where in Canada, and you know this as well as I do, uh, Dev, yep. we're in that transition to warm weather. So mm -hmm. the heat's getting turned off, right? Yeah. You know, it's not cold enough in here mm -hmm. for us and my tank's running. So all of a sudden when the heat went, you know, no heat, <laughs> it's electric heat, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it was just like, oh, and they started to get cold. Well, daytime so, is hot. The window's mm -hmm. open. Nighttime is cold, freezing. Yeah, that's so the intermediate. Right, and mm. we're right in that middle one. So all of a sudden, it's like, put my fingers in the water. I noticeably know it's colder, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's neat. And I'm going, it, yeah. and my battery pack wasn't charged up for me to plug heaters in. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Now, they're only good for a uh, 100-watt heater out of those uh, two, two uh, 250 watt battery packs. Mm-hmm. Right, yep. I, you can get somewhere around three hours. Yeah. Right. Now, cor yep. now is corals will be okay in cooler water as long as it's not like super cold. I mean, th Paul had his seventy-two. Yeah. Yeah, seventy-two degrees. And salt water does retain heat for a while, so I mean, heat would be the last thing I'd put battery backup or a backup yep. to. If you have a generator, I mean, have outer. But if you're running off batteries, heaters will kill it pretty fast. Same with lighting. You don't need lighting. Yep. Heating, that's, if you're uh, not like Arctic reefing, I mean, you'll be fine for a while. So And uh, that, that's, I mean, that's a really, really good point. The mm -hmm. way that we heat it up, you mentioned the PEX tubing. But once again, we like to utilize metal, you know, for an emergency situation as a heat transfer media because you get more one-to-one -one direct transfer from that heat. Mm -hmm. So you're getting this, um, you know, 
we basically boil water because gas is typically still on, especially in, uh, you know, in a lot of the municipals and a lot of the, you know, city areas and neighborhoods, the gas stays on. So you can mm -hmm. heat up water, put it into a five gallon bucket and recirculate that heating coil back into your system mm -hmm. if you start going below. Yep. So that would be a better way to heat your water. Yep, that's a good call. I, I do like that idea too about... um on a big tank doing like your water heater or something or your hot water tank and running that through the tank on a temperature controller. It's kind of a cool way to do it without using electricity for if you have gas heating and you're heating that water tank anyways. Correct. One day when I have a giant tank, it could be good. <laughs> and I'm saying metal, meaning aluminum mm -hmm. works really, really well as a heat transfer media. Don't use copper. It won't. Be <laughs> We try to stay away where'd from all that. My where'd all my shrimp go? Yeah, do not use copper in a reef tank. <laughs> copper is toxic to a lot of inverts. So definitely don't, don't use copper. And salt water is very, very corrosive on copper as yeah, well so. because it's a green electrolyte. Mm -hmm. It will eat it up quick. Um, I've seen people use PEX tubing, and that seems to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, personally, I don't know if I'd throw aluminum in my tank. Actually, yeah, I might be okay. But um, yeah, a PEX or plastic, or even if you have a thing, throw it in a bottle and let it float in your tank. You know, there's lots of ways you can kind of do it that way. Yep. yep. Um, so on other different things for redundancies, if you use barb fittings, use hose clamps. Um, if something got uh -huh. clogged and built up pressure, I mean, there's possibility that could split and you start, then your pump, your reactor pump, whatever it is, could be squirting water all over the place, your return pump. So having hose yep. barbs on all your things, uh, don't use the metal ones. The metal ones can rust and corrode. Most of them are steel. You can buy the plastic ones, mm -hmm. and they clip on there that it's that extra level of it's building up pressure. It's not going to slide your hose off. Um, it's never happened personally, but I've I've heard of it happening, so it does happen. What else is good tips? Um, ATO pumps. Those I've seen fail by not turning on, and I've seen them fail on. The biggest messes I've seen is where someone's plumbed it directly to their RODI, which is trouble. Mm -hmm. oh, yep. Generally, I always think it's... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Skimmer. Everybody keeps on uh, putting mm. on the skimmer onto the UPS as well. That's one of the biggest energy hogs. Mm. Um, you know, their oversized uh, skimmer with the oversized pump. Yep. That tends to drain uh, the UPS is really, really quick. So, if you're in that emergency situation, turn off your skimmer. Mm -hmm. You have air stones and yep. you have air pumps. They last a lot longer. Yeah. What's good, everyone? Everything's good, uh, Tyler. Everything's good. Uh, so on my UPS, I have two. I have a, I have a like a APC UPS, which powers the basic stuff. I think, and then I have a giant battery that has my MP40s and my return pump on it, and that's it. Uh, and, and the Neptune Apex head, so it can actually send me alerts and tell me the power's up. So th that's kind of what I have uh -huh. on mine. But though, to me, flow is number one essential. Um, if you can run power head, best. If you can do that, air pump second best. Or run them both, but. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Does anyone know what lionfish tastes like? I've never I tried do. a lionfish. How are I they? Have. How are they? They, they taste like bland white fish. Yeah. <laughs> Don't taste like much of anything. Yeah, so you need a lot of sauce. Yeah, yeah. you do need a lot of sauce with them. <laughs> good to know. Um, I was having a good laugh. I was thinking to myself, I am buying another uh, return pump. Mm -hmm. The pump that I currently have is going to be relegated to uh, water changes for the most part. Yep. Because uh, it's an AC, it's good and powerful, it'll do that job. But my brain also went, oh, and if that one ever fails, I have a return pump to throw back in my tank if my return pump fails. Exactly. Very nice. Yep. Yeah. Al always good to have a backup. I mean, one aspect, some people are like, oh, I'm not going to spend all that money to have a second pump. But on the same side, you'll go drop, you know, thousands of dollars on corals over the years. <laughs> so you, you kind of got to think these little little bits go a long way. I'm still, yeah. the more I think about it, the more I'm digging this dual return pump thing, and I think I'm going to do it on my next one. Just have two outputs and two pumps. Each one have, each pump has its own line back to the tank. And then if uh -huh. one dies, it doesn't matter. Your sump, everything's still ready to roll. Or if a power supply dies, anything, you know, you got time to fix it, your tank's not going to miss a beat. Yep, yep. exactly. Yeah. Hey, Cuz, wow. did we miss anything? No, because every time I tried to speak, you talked over me, so... I think you just repeated what I was saying. Nick, Nick, Nick has the mic. What do you got, Nick? 
so. Oh. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, um, so Josh in the tank no, I, was... I, I, he sounds very, very low. He does. He's in the tank low. again. He's bubbling. Oh, us. He, he's right. straw bubbling. Straw bubbling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Kelkronaut is asking, what's a good budget controller? pH, temp, salinity. Uh, there's the Apex Junior. I don't know if that comes to salinity, but I believe it's pH and temperature. Um, uh, Reef Keep Reefkeeper will do the same yeah. thing on a budget. Yeah, Reef Keeper. Um, yeah, Reef Keeper is a good one. Um, but in all honesty, salinity. Don't worry about uh, it. I mean, it's nice to have. I would probably, if you're only worried about the other two things, get yourself a. Uh, uh, there's going to be a new. What is it? Uh, Senai Reef Keeper. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's going to replace the uh, ammonia with uh, alkalinity real time. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I would just find a used controller for cheap. So an upgrade. I would. That's the best bet. I mean, when I bought my Apex, I just bought a used one for a few hundred bucks because it was about half of what a new one was and does the job. Got all the probes. On a random story, I was actually building one, my own controller, and then I was going to buy all the probes and I ended up buying a whole used Apex Classic for the price of what it cost me to buy all the probes for my <laughs> DIY controller. So I ended up just so buying one. So that went out one. the window, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I ended up selling it. My buddy used it to just control his lights and a temperature backup and all that jazz, but... <laughs> I have seen some of the sketchiest DIY stuff, I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. Although, oh, yeah. that video I did a couple of weeks ago with the optical auto top off, that thing's been solid the last few weeks. It's perfect. Yep, that looked like it. Literally, the tank drops a couple of millimeters, beep, tops it back up, and it's like probably like the most stable salinity ever with those dual, with the optical sensors in there. It's great. Yeah, well, if you look at a Coral Box A100 and uh, you take apart the box, mm -hmm. uh, you realize that it's just the two relays, right? Oh, there's, so this there's one comes. Go ahead. No, sorry. Yeah, they're super simple inside, eh? Yeah, so there you go. If you want to build that yourself and you have the width for all to do it. Oh, look at that big word. Ooh. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, you can, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people all the time, you can DIY. Just don't show me this killer life for growing coral. And you've bought, you know, written those LED strips, stick strips. You know what oh, I'm talking yeah. about off eBay. Um, and, you know, a DMX controller that you spent more on that than you did on the actual lights <laughs> and tell me how it's growing coral and I'm looking in your tank going, well, you're growing algae. Yeah. So with those lights, just off topic, but um, when you see the ones that use those little tiny SMDs, most of those are like half watt diodes. And if you have a tiny shallow tank, probably work, but on a deeper tank, they just don't quite have the penetration power. So I generally look for ones that have higher water LEDs. Compl completely off topic. Just throwing that out there. No, I didn't mean to. It was yeah. just, well, it kind of was. It's just a DIY version of a backup device, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know why people think that you don't need lighting in, in an, unless you're going to be out for days. Yeah, so. And I mean, days. Well, I think what Cruz mentioned earlier was about three days is probably fine. Then after, seven, after 72 hours, it's starting to push it. But any light could work, right? Like, you don't need fancy LED blue lights. I think Cruz said they had, what, 5,000, 6,000K... Just LED bulbs, like regular Home Depot bulbs that you could use, right? Corals are fine under white lights. They're still going to grow. Corals actually grow faster under white lights, but you just don't have that nice coloration. So any type of light source, I mean, it's better than nothing. Photosynthesis you, you is photosynthesis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, because I was thinking, Dev, and maybe you remember, remember the big ice storm in Ontario? Uh, yep. Yeah. That, that was what some people went without power for 11 weeks. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm like, I don't think your tank's alive, man. <laughs> no kidding. Melanie Simpson for the super chat. $10. Thank you very much, Melanie. Much, much appreciated. If Bob is in the chat, I want to throw a quick shout out to Bob. Um, I started a Patreon a little while ago. I haven't really said anything about it, but Bob was my first Patreon, and I really appreciate you. So thank you, Bobs, and cheers if you are. Sweet. Sweet. And Melanie, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, who would have thought... Flower pot coral is a killer. Those are usually what we want to have a harder coral. I, I hear from a lot of people. So, um, yeah, even the the guy who can keep anything alive that runs uh, one of my local fish stores said that he can't keep one alive more than like nine to twelve months max. Yeah. Um, he said he's gone through like three of them, and he knows he feeds them with um like special stuff. He said he's even tried one with reefroids because he he's trying to keep one alive, and he said they um that just they, in a tank, he said that they don't want to live more than a year. So they might be kind of like the flame scallop, but I have a flame scallop and I'm 
I'm uh, dedicated to keeping it alive. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, I don't know how much it's relevant, but I find a lot of harder curls. I dose phytoplankton to my tank. And... Yeah, I, I do the same. Okay, yeah. So for me, I feel a lot of NPSs and, you know, smaller clams and a lot of pickier things. I, I, I personally feel that there's a lot of benefit to doing it. It is one of the base kind of food sources in the ocean. I mean, it feeds your pods. It feeds a bunch of corals and stuff. I see Cruz is ready to say something. But um, so I, I personally feel there's some good benefits. So I dose phytoplankton and pods on a fairly regular basis. My nano, I dose pods almost weekly, but that's just because I got a lot of pod eaters in my nano. But I think a lot of those things goes a, a long way into creating that more of a natural habitat. Mm. So Ricky... I was going to say... Uh... The, there's certain ones too, flower pot coral, uh, Alevapora. Am I saying that right? Say it again. Olivia, uh, Alevapora. Wow, I just cannot say that word right. Alveopora. The ones that actually, Alveopora. Alveopora. Yeah, Alveopora. Yeah, Alveopora. Um, Alveopora. Mm -hmm. Tend to be a little hardier mm -hmm. than Ganeopora, right? And you'll be able to tell the difference because they actually look like a flower. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's good to know. Um, I've had Ganeopora. I don't think I've had Alev. Alev have you say it? I'll be okay. <laughs> I can't even I say it, it now. You totally messed me up. I probably could have said it two minutes ago. <laughs> I'll be a Bora. <laughs> line man reefer. <laughs> line man reefer. So glad I'm a line man. I'll know my power will come back on because I'll be the one fixing it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, DC, I like dosing pods. Yeah. I sh should actually try putting pods on a doser. That'd be interesting. Just pipe a little culture in the sump. 20 bucks every two weeks to keep a mandarin happy. DC, I'm going to maybe have to teach you how to culture your own pods. They are not, they're expensive to buy. So that's why I culture my own. So I'll help you out with that one later. So as you can see by Nick's photo, he has a very small tank for his poor tank with um, some glass. Aptasia. <laughs> yeah, that's... Glass. Glass. I love how you... I was going to say what, what gave it away for me that it was fake is that it's a, there's Aptasia in it. And I, I know that a yellow tang would need Aptasia. I love how it's not the tang that only has his nose submerged is the Aptasia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's I was like, I caught you, Nick. <laughs> yeah. It's a glass of enemy. It's not Aptasia. I'm surprised you didn't Photoshop a little sushi roll and some Dorian there for the little guy. <laughs> No, he's fine enough. Look at him. He's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, DC hey. Reaper said twenty dollars every two weeks to keep my man mandarin happy. He, he's buying a lot of pods. Wow. Oh, I just cultivate them. Yeah, you need to cultivate them. I'm gonna help yeah, you, DC. That's too much. Them. I was buying them for a while. It was like twenty, thirty bucks a bottle. I'm like, Psh, I can do this. And now I trade them to some of the stores for credit. So it's beneficial if you if you get good at it. So, um, Dev, Calca, yep. Calcanord, I think, has kind of a, it's a redundancy in an off way question. He's asking mm -hmm. about people see, seeing them use the concrete mix now in their tanks, mm -hmm. um, which would the redundancy being to keep your rocks from falling against or into the bottom of your tank, mm -hmm. um, which we all know is kind of important. That is, <laughs> good point, good point. Um, now, I have had no mix, like none. Mm -hmm. I haven't messed with it. I've seen it being used. Um, I really don't have an opinion. To okay. Be honest. Now, certain concretes. Okay, you go first, Nick. No, you go ahead, Dev. It's your screen. <laughs> um, okay. So, certain concretes can leach stuff into the water. Um, there is one, I don't know if it's like a Portland cement, I can't fully remember, but there is certain mixes that are less likely to leach. Now, a lot of people that do this will also let them soak in heated salt water with flow for an extended period of time to make sure it leaches whatever said stuff is out. Um, now, I think it's Portland Spence the safer one. I can't, I don't know. Nick, you probably have more details. I've never done this. This is just what I've read. So, what do you got? Yeah, Portland cement is better, but the issue with the cement is in the stabilizers and also in the lime content. Mm -hmm. um, some of the guys that you see creating artificial rocks, you know, the, um, the ceramic rocks, mm -hmm. um, actually, there's, I won't name names, but there's some of the companies that actually don't use the correct stabilizers. Mm -hmm. So the stabilizers are in the, um, in the mix that when they form the ceramic shapes, they, they hold rigid while they fire them. You know, so they hold their, their yep. consistency. Um, there is a guy in the UK actually that I was speaking to recently, and he he went to great lengths 
to ensure that the stabilizers we use are reef safe. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to do some projects with him shortly because uh, some of the stuff that these guys can create is ab mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. Okay. So yeah, yeah that, I'm looking forward to that. Nice. But yeah, be really careful. Be okay. Really careful with that stuff. So Dave's nano tanks, it leaches lime and has a high pH. Okay, so there's one thing to consider. In my in my tank, when I glued the rock, I used some stuff called Fijicrete. I bought it within Canada. Supposedly, it's reef safe. Um, I did also cycle it for about a month before I even put it in the tank, mainly just to pre-cycle the rock and kind of kickstart my cycle. So I just let it run in a brute for about a month or so. Now, with that, I mean, I cemented chunks of my rock. So, I mean, technically, I mean, fail safe. Not having a rock smash your glass is a big one. So, on mine, I only did maximum two rocks together and I partially did this so I could actually take it apart make it manageable so it doesn't weigh hundreds of pounds but um I tried to make sure I only ever glued maximum two rocks together and then made it kind of keystone fit together aside from that but yeah make sure it is something that's reef safe there's epoxies now you can get those little plastic beads that go and when you heat them and you can mold them in they dry and harden aquaphor cement it might be that stuff um so concrete pavers good tank bad <laughs> Yeah, so one of those things. I mean, you do want your rock structure to be secure. Um, on this note, aquascaping epoxies will absorb or remove or consume some of the oxygen in your tank. So yes. if you have live stuff in your tank, if you're mounting a few small frags, not a big deal. If you're gluing one rock, not a big deal. But don't do a massive aquascape with putty in one day because it's going to suck out a ton of oxygen out of your tank. So that's another thing to consider. Do you want a tip to yep. that? Sure. Oh, um, rock, rock. Ooh, during a power outage, also, mm -hmm. um, don't dose. If you're dosing anything, stop dosing during that power outage as well. Mm -hmm. It drives off uh, available oxygen and degasses it as well. Hmm. Drops your DO and drops your ORP. Good to know. Considerably. So no, no dosers on the battery backup. And if you're manly dosing, take the day off. Yeah, as soon as I, um, just addressing what they're telling um, DC Reefer in the chat about the pods to do them in a sump, that's one of the things that I am going to do is um, have a have an area of my sump I'm already planning out. Mm -hmm. When I get my larger system up and yeah. running, um, I'm going to do a ton of pods. Nice. And I'm probably going to have something that eats the pods. But So, the, so I'm, I'm going to be... Um, I'm going to be producing quite a few of them, I think. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't they reproduce quite quickly? If you feed them, um, so yeah. if you dose phytoplankton and certain stuff through your tank, that's one of the main or if sources. I, grow my own I would build your own and then add it to the tank once in yeah. a while. I'm, I'm gonna have my own little uh, ecosystem going, so I'm yeah. gonna have I'm gonna grow my own phyto that's gonna eat that's gonna be eaten mm -hmm. by my yeah. I'm gonna come on. I haven't. Monica in the art of stoicism. It'll be in, this in this her... whole self sustaining system. I heard of this challenge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Now, and I when it all goes wrong, we'll laugh at your tears and drink them. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to pry onto my refractometer and make sure that it's 1.024. Yeah, you're yeah, like, oh, I perfect. Did. I'll cry into my tank. <laughs> cry right into the tank, yeah. Um, on that note, I have not done this yet, but I've considered trying this as a fun experiment. If you can make a self-sustaining phytoculture where you use tank water... And then it would in turn drip back into your tank and kind of this ongoing cycle and you maybe just drip a fertilizer in there once in a while. Now, some phytoplankton cultures need to be super sterile or they'll crash. Nanocropolis is one of the more forgiving ones. So I'm still kind of tempted to try this. This might be a future project just for fun. I always want to see if it'll work. But it could Real be quickly, a cool way. Where exactly does phytoplankton in the tank come from? I know that's really a stupid um, question. So It's not just like grown from the light, is it? Is it like an algae? It is an algae. No, um, the uh, the uh, phytopixies put it in during the night. Phytopixies? Oh, ah, okay, that's where yeah. that comes from. Um, so you do grow with light. Um, they uh, they take your teeth and replace it with phytoplankton. <laughs> You're like my tank is so healthy. Uh, <laughs> has got my stroller. Oh, she's she's starting the Nick you bubbling method. Bubbling? <laughs> this is my backup oxygenator. <laughs> nice um okay so normally you start with a culture or you buy live phytoplankton don't buy dead stuff um the stuff i originally started with was i can't remember the name but they have a white cap and a black cap the black cap was the live version i have a bottle in my fridge i'll look later it's probably dead by now but um 
you got to start with all, either there is stuff from LG Barn, different places, they sell it, buy it live, or you can buy the little paste that you mix with water. And you basically add a fertilizer to it. Now, F2 is kind of what, what Glard's F2, whatever. There's a bunch of different companies. Um, Fritz makes it, Canadian, or Florida Aqua Farms, a bunch of different places. But you use the fertilizer to feed the algae, and then it will kind of culture and grow. Now, if you neglect your culture for too long, it will crash. So you need to split yep. it and harvest it, or otherwise you risk it crashing on itself. Um, now, sometimes it can be finicky. If you're not too overly sterile or stuff, get contaminants get in there, that could also crash it. So it can be finicky. Mm -hmm. But if you culture your own, once it's going, yep. this, this is why I'm curious to see if I can culture it with tank water or not. This, I'm just going to try with the reactor for fun. I don't know. I just feel like experimenting. Did you cover the sterilization depth with that? Um, so... When I'm cutting it and splitting it and stuff, I'm normally not too worried about sterilization. But when it, every month or two, I'll completely empty out a container and I'll put a bit of like rubbing alcohol in there and just like re sterilize it all. But eventually it will crash if it's not sterile. So that's something you got to keep in mind. What are you feeding it with? Pardon? What are you feeding it with? I have a giant bottle of fertilizer from Florida Aqua Farms and I have another couple from Fritz. So I have a couple different brands. It's kind of like right. the F2 type of deal. I have heard of people using miracle Grow to do it. However, that also has nitrates and phosphates and stuff in it. So if you're using that for your phytoplankton and dosage your tank, you're just putting nitrates and phosphate into your tank. A lot of people don't want to do that, so. Didn't they use, uh, Cruz, didn't they use uh, yeast as well? They could uh, utilize uh, yeast, um, or uh, you could also utilize uh, a product called Reef Bugs out there. It's a um, oh, basically yeah. a bacterial plankton as well as uh, mm -hmm. some other um, microbes and other yeast products in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's a good substitute because, uh, you know, when people talk about feeding their, you know, their system plankton, you know, everybody automatically gravitates towards phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of other kind of plankton out there, you know, zooplankton bacterioplankton and of course phytoplankton that everybody loves mm -hmm. but uh yeah there's other substitutes if uh if you can't grow it mm -hmm. you know the phytoplankton and have your own reactor or you're finding that you know phytoplankton is very expensive and you don't have the you know that type of uh time to you know cultivate your own reef bugs is a good um i want to say substitute for a plankton mm -hmm. or a lot of filter feeders a lot of plankton feeders Mm -hmm. So, Cruz, what do you think? Tank water culturing? Do you think it will crash? Or do you think it will sustain itself? It's got a lot of bacteria in it. I'd be, I'd yeah, be wary. Yeah. Unless you thinking. actually run it through, you know, a UV sterilizer first, hmm. then whatever is dyed will release the necessary, uh, um, you know, nitrates and phosphates back yeah, into your tank. So I might not even need a fertilizer if I run it through yeah. UV sterilizer when I top it off. Well, I have, a, I have an in on this topic. <laughs> do, do you? There's a guy here in New Brunswick. He he does his own uh, Strange Reef is the name of his company. Yeah, and he does mm -hmm. his own uh, pod, blah blah blah. And I just I don't have a lot from him. And he's a very elusive fella. His dad runs Corey Feed, so they mm -hmm. supply the feed for the salmon and trout industries here. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and that's kind of what got him started. And um, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll share my screen. I'll just share a pic. This this is all he has up. He doesn't let anybody see his setup. Go mm -hmm. figure. Um, <laughs> Sneak peek. Yeah, but this is all he's ever shown. Let's see. You'd have to share my screen, I guess. Uh, no, you have to do that. Uh, if you hover over the Hangouts in top left or right or somewhere, there should be a thing to share your screen. I, I, I can focus it on you, but yeah, you got to share it. Send a message. Nope, nope, nope. Where the heck is it? It's not here. <laughs> I'm all confused. Yeah. Is it? Nope. Nope. It's a little green square with an arrow or something like that, I believe. Is it a little green square? So, yep. Nope. Hide messages. Nope. Don't want to do... No, it's not showing up for me. Go figure. Yeah, weird. That's all right. Um, but if you go look up Strange Reef on Facebook, and he's in Fredericton, is what he lists himself as, mm -hmm. he does have a picture of three of the cultures that he uses to help feed his pods. Um, and I'm going to guess some of these are phyto and zooplankton. Okay. So, mm -hmm. That's all he's yep. ever shown. If, uh, yeah. If you're also uh, interested in, uh, you know, raising your own phytoplankton, mm -hmm. you know, I would go to like a biological supply house, like Carolina Supply, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Carolina bought uh, Biologics, or you could also go to Frey Scientific. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they also have uh, phytoplankton uh, cultures that are pure strength. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they, they claim 99%, 99.9% yep. uh, pure strain mm -hmm. of the isochrosis, uh, the nanocrosis, and all the other, all the other uh, phytoplanktons. I started with a mix of blends, but I, I kind of have a theory that Nano took over, and that's the main one I have going now. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So, yeah, it's, gotcha. it's a darker green. It looks like Nano, but either way, it works well. I mainly culture it. I add it to my tank all the time, but I mainly culture it to feed the pods because pods are the main mm -hmm. one because pods love phytoplankton. <laughs> so phytoplankton is kind of one of the base things of the food sources in the ocean mm -hmm. and in your tank if you're dosing it. So NPS, yep. pods, all these little creatures are going to love it. Even corals, right? Lots of them are going to grab onto those little particles and Absolutely. suck her up. And, so. uh, yep. And on another note, if you have enough, um, you know, miracle mud, enough surface area that is actually exposed to light uh, in your sump, you'll actually start developing your own phytoplankton culture from there as well. Ah, interesting. Good to know. So, what yep. you're saying is I might already be making phytoplankton since I have a radion. Yep. Above my yep. egg crate so slash phytoplankton, <laughs> phytoplankton, stereoplankton, and zooplankton will mm -hmm. come off of it. because yeah. remember, it is wild harvested. It is wild harvested yep. mud, never been killed. So just naturally dried. So with the mud, mm -hmm. it's also feeding a bacteria culture, which in turn is going to feed a lot of the zooplankton, and other the type of yeah, pods, right? Phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it also breaks down a lot of the waste products, mm -hmm. which in turn also feeds the phytoplankton, mm -hmm. you know, for the nit uh, for the nitrates and phosphates. So, yeah. nice. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Lots of good stuff. Is that a yeah, new mic reef to use? Yes, it is. Never have you seen the Refux product before. What's it called? Sorry. Refux. I have not. Yeah, that one. If you if you grab some of that and just pick it in, then you'll see. Yeah, more waste. Yeah, Mark Weiss used to uh, make it. It mm -hmm. was branded under him. Now it's branded underneath Reef Bright because they have seen that there was uh, benefits to it as well. Nice. Rookie Reefer is asking that a new mic. Yes, it is. I got a sweet deal off the classified side a few weeks ago. <laughs> Does it sound good? Is it Rookie Reefer Sounds approved? Great. Excellent. Yeah, my I had a, on the technical side, I previously had a dynamic microphone which is good for cutting out background noise, but you gotta be really close to it. Otherwise it's very quiet where this one it's, um, I don't know, not down. I don't know. Cardroid, I think mind blanking, but, uh, yeah, definitely sounds a lot better. And it's nice that it does not be like right up to my mouth to talk to it, which is nice. Is it a, is it road? It is, is an it... audio technica. I think it's like AT 35 or something. Okay. Uh, road ones are nice and fancy. These are like the, the budget version of the road, but they work pretty well. That's kind of the newest one. I'm digging it. They uh, they made it look they made it look strikingly similar on the end. That's yeah, why I asked. They do that. <laughs> I'm just buying. I'm just gonna buy an M Audio unit and use an SM58. Screw it. Yeah, that works. Yeah. You know, um. Years ago, years and years ago, when I would do a stick am, I used an old pair of broken headphones. Yeah. As a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That was broke. So, That's awesome. So yeah, people can still hear me. Yeah. So a speaker can also work in reverse. <laughs> now, completely random pro tip. If you need elastic bands for your mic, girls' hair bands work well as replacements. <laughs> yeah, my, um, I have a blue Yeti that has the, um, the mm. little, uh, what do you call it? The, the multi, what do you call it? Suspension you know what I'm talking about? The, the rings shock mount. thing? Yeah. Yeah, shock mount. That's mm -hmm. it. Thanks. And I, um, I had to replace the, uh, the elastic on it already. It mm -hmm. didn't last a summer in the heat here. No, and, no. Uh, yeah, I used I used the uh, the elastic bands, and they work really well. Yeah, thanks. Um, that that does work really well. Rookie Reefer, what mixer to use? I have uh, what is this? Behringer, I think. X N E Y twelve oh four USB, and I found it for hundred bucks on the classified site. I'm not gonna Ooh. lie, I just watch them and just find deals on cool stuff that's on my wish list, and it works. So I wanted a USB mixer and this is the one that I found that was cheap. So I bought it Uh side random note. I think we've covered most of the redundancy topics. So it's kind of a bit of a random live stream. Now I got some sweet shirts made. Woo. So mainly cause going to Reefapalooza super stoked. I have to wake up 
in 12 hours from now I have to be at an airport. It's going to be a severe lack of sleep tonight. So if any of you guys are going to be at Reef of Palooza, make sure you come find me and say hi. Because it would be great mm. to kind of meet a bunch of you guys actually in person. <laughs> we don't do that out here. <laughs> do what? I want to go. We had get togethers out here are, are like bar fights in Britain. You know what I mean? It's all friendly yeah. for 10 seconds and then it just seems to, you know, degrade <laughs> into high school crap. <laughs> nice. But yeah, so I don't know. I, I'm excited for Rufa Palooza. I, I would be. I, I'm, we're, I don't know. We might go to Than's thing mm -hmm. in July. Nice. Um, but we're also really debating Macna. Do Macna. So, I'm going to Macna too. I've never been to a reef show in my life ever. No. And this year, for whatever reason, I'm going to Reef Palooza and Macna. So I'm excited yeah. for it. I would be, and uh, I'd be the guy having to fit on the floor crying like a three-year-old. No, I want that. No, let me buy it. Well, that's the thing. It's like, can I bring it back? Ah. So I've been heavily researching bringing corals back to Canada. And mm -hmm. the problem is, if it's not on the CITES list, it's fair game. But there's a lot of stuff on the CITES list. Yeah. And there's also the, it cannot be on a rock. Yep. It must be on a frag plug. I, I've rationed um, Zoe's and rock flowers and stuff are harm percent for a game. Acroporas are very, 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 very hit and miss because there's a lot yeah. of stuff on that side of list. Yeah. You know what, though? Yeah. If you tell a CRA agent it's a, a sponge, <laughs> <laughs> he'll probably believe you yeah. if you don't have 20 of them. You know, yeah. well, all different. Just tell, them it's, just tell them it's a flower. Yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, this is a little water lily. <laughs> <laughs> I know, eh? Oh. oh, there's uh, there's regulations around vegetation as well. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, Dev and I were filming like, through. <laughs> yeah, Dev and I were filming through CITES one, two, and three appendices yeah. all day yep. today. Mm -hmm. So I've been I'm trying to figure out what's fair game, and sadly, a lot of the hard corals are questionable. Poor poor yeah. Dev, he's gonna come back and he's gonna be like, "What's this all about, eh? What you trying to pull, <laughs> eh?" Yeah. <laughs> Should I talk like that too? <laughs> no, we yeah, you can if you want. We uh, don't actually talk like that. Only in Newfoundland. <laughs> oh, that'll be all the hate coming your way. No, there I know. Go. So, I made brief two shirts, so you'll notice me. If you don't recognize me, I'm in like every video I put up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, nice to meet ya. I think it's <laughs> nice to meet ya. At the bottom, a with a question mark. Nice. Should do that just for fun. <laughs> you should. You yeah. absolutely should. What's that, sorry? Have you booked in for Las Vegas? No, that's something to figure out once I'm back from Reef of Palooza. Um, in... I'm going to Vegas. Cruz is going to Vegas. Oh, I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to yeah. go. I haven't booked it, but I'm going to go. Going Vegas. I, will, going I will very likely go to Vegas. You're going. You're going. Annika's going to Vegas. She's already considering it. That's a yes. Very, <laughs> very likely I will go to yeah. Vegas because we actually have a condo in Vegas. So oh. it would be free for me to stay there. That's a no-brainer. Awesome. You're committed. So we're all staying yeah. with Annika then in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so Vegas, at least for Canada, Vegas is very cheap to get to in general. Like a couple hundred bucks, you get flight, hotel, everything. So Vegas yeah. is one of the easiest ones to commit to. So I'm definitely going. I kind of got talked into Rufa Palooza because I may have free hotel accommodations, aka I'm free loading off somebody. But it's gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I, I'm super stoked. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So yeah, see, yeah, when uh, when we go over there to Macna. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to be at a table uh, for most ah, of the time. Well, I will come visit. I have my, my camera gear all packed, getting ready to roll for it. So I'm going to shoot tons of video. Hopefully I don't run out of memory card space, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sure they have a Best Buy. Yeah. I already bought an additional. I have three 120 gig cards, but 100 and... Are they, are they really fast? Because I, yes. I went ahead and dropped some money on buying a few. Um, my brother-in-law just got married recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and bought a few cards. But they, it feels like it takes forever to take pictures. So um, I got my Sony mirrorless DSLR. And to shoot 4K, it doesn't. it's like, oh, your memory card's too slow. I had to buy like crazy fast ones, overly priced. They're like 85 bucks or something. But they're 120 gigs. And then they should give you about two to two and a half hours of 4K footage. I'm going to slow it down around 25 frames a second. 60, 50 megabits instead of 100. Cold is a little lacking, but I'll get a little little more footage out of it. So we'll see. So I got three of those cards now. I bought an extra one, so I'm hoping that will keep me covered. Hopefully it's about six yeah. hours of video I'll be able to record over the weekend. And I wouldn't There's be surprised if I did. 
Sorry, there's a question in the chat that I may know the answer to for, for once, finally. Uh, Kalkanort, I see people 3D print pod hotels and stuff for pla what plastics are safe. So ABS and PLA are the two different types of plastic for extrusion for 3D printing. And when you heat it, it's, mm -hmm. it's not safe for human consumption like food unless you get food safe plastics. I would say go with, um, God, I want to say PLA. Overall, I would say do not 3D print anything that's going inside of your tank because over time, the chemicals that are inside of the extruded plastic are going to leach into your water and they are going to end up in your corals and in your fish. Um, I'm going to throw I'm one getting... out there for you quickly. Okay. Um, I, PLA. I I sorry, go ahead. I'll let you finish. Okay. I'm sorry. What I would say you could do is if you want, if you really, really have a part that is that you really want, I would mm -hmm. go with something like Delrin, which is an engineering plastic, and I would mill it out. Or I would, if you want to go way crazy, I would do something like, um, like molding it, mm -hmm. maybe, but do it and out of a food safe plastic. Yep. Um, that doesn't off gas or what was the other you guys said degrade over time. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that it is food safe and do your research on it. If you want, what I do when I cut up because I work with plastics all the time for my mm -hmm. job, um, I would contact the manufacturer and tell them what your intended purpose is and they can tell you everything about that. Mm -hmm. They can tell you at what salinity it's going to start to biodegrade, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, so, okay. I'm actually saying that PPG. Wait, wait, wait. Right. No, PTG doesn't. She did not mention that one, though. Um, no, 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 no. PLA, PLA and ABS. PLA will. PLA is the most common 3D printed material that will degrade over time in a tank. Um, and that one's not as tough. Like, if it's out in the sun, it will get soft, blah, blah, blah. ABS it, it is... Warp. Yeah, it will warp. ABS are questionably safe. Um, I do have a couple of parts I use for a little while. Um, I did yeah. soak them for a little bit and just RODI water for fun. But the one I would yeah. trust in water is PETG. Um, okay. Pet G is food safe. You can use yes. it for it's what water bottles stuff are made of. So if you're gonna three print something okay. for yeah. a tank, hundred percent, I would recommend Pet G. That's the only yes. one I would say is, I would probably say is safe, like ninety nine percent. Yeah, should be fine. So it's um. Is we it... use for the RFGs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So uh, is it easy for you guys to find the Pet G? Yep, I buy mine off Amazon for like twenty five bucks a roll or whatever. Okay, cool. For like a kilogram. Yep. Okay. That, cool. that, that's what I use in my printer. So. Okay, is it just, is it standard sizes for, like, the extrusion head? Yep, uh, 1.75 okay. like mils three, what I use. Okay, okay, cool. I have every, I have every size head, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I've only used 1.75. I haven't bothered to 3 mil or the bigger heads, but, or, or for the actual nozzle diameter, I kind of use 0 0.04 as my all-arounder. I'm a, I'm more into milling. I have a carbide 3D now that I've been That's working it. with. So I prefer milling because I can just type in a bunch of numbers, set it up, mm -hmm. um, tram the head, and I'm and just push a button and it's done. I'm just googling that desktop 3D milling machine. That looks kind of fun. Nice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. No, very cool. Yeah. Do you, are you familiar with like G code or M code or yep. any of that? From okay. 3D printing, then, yeah. Then it, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then then it'll be a lot of fun. I used to do a lot of work on a Kent. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do a lot of CNC machining. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. Anarchy, you don't even realize that it's like a fully qualified piece. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'm a roboticist. So I do, like I said, like I said before, I have my background. I was a pre-med student, but I went mm -hmm. ahead and went the robotics route. So. Oh, that's but very cool. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a roboticist, right? But, what is yeah. your actual job? Yeah, I what did. Is my job? What is your real job? Um, well, I'm, so I worked in the game industry for years. I was a mm. programmer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wrote software, uh, middleware uh, yeah. for the game industry. And then I did a lot of electronics tinkering on the side, mm -hmm. but that didn't really make money. And then I moved to Los Angeles to work in Hollywood to make, to do mostly consulting and to yep. build robots for movies and television oh, shows. Cool. And that was where like my income came from. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, when I moved to Houston four years ago, I did that because I started a company that was, um, I had been doing a lot of after school programs, writing curriculum, or not that you guys need my whole like CV here, but um, yeah, keep going. You're halfway through. <laughs> okay, but I I was doing um, after school curriculum for underserved students, like mm -hmm. mostly you know 
minority students that don't have opportunities to go to college. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to get them into STEM fields, namely robotics. Yeah. That's what that's I was cool. doing. And so, sorry, that's my kid. <laughs> she, she's like talking. Now. I know, I know. It's okay. Just watch your show. Um, so <laughs> she's trying to tell me what her, what's happening on Sarah and Duck. Mm. So, um, so uh, from there, I started a company here in Houston um, that was creating curriculum for K through 12 engineering. Um, so they kept doing 3D printer stuff. Okay. It was based mostly on 3D printing and mm -hmm. um, teaching STEM fields or STEM education, I should say. Yeah. No, oh, very cool. So you're and then we sold and then we sold that company. I retired and now I'm like train and then i had kids mm -hmm. so i have toddlers and now i'm like picking up hobbies and getting back into youtube and you trying to fill my days with things that are fun because i don't have a job job mm -hmm. um i just kind of i invest in other companies that do like uh biotech stuff like that so nice. it's kind of boring it's not really mm -hmm. i mean it seems exciting but it's really not like day to day it's kind of yeah. like lame that's fair so. I am an unofficial. I unofficially do that stuff on the hobby, tack it, make it work level. So it's kind of interesting. Well, okay, but you're really quickly, but you're rolling your hobby into a career, right? Kind of, sort of. My real job is in healthcare. I manage a bunch of the IT tech okay. stuff. Um, okay, so you're so you're a nerd also. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I build a I lot of crazy stuff. Like I I built my own aquarium controller. I mean, auto top offs. Like the one I did a video on a couple weeks ago was a simple okay. one. I've made yeah. fancier ones with Arduino and multiple sensors, but for doing yeah. one I was going to share, I wanted to keep it fairly simple that people could potentially do. Right? I didn't want to make it too high level. Cool. So I, awesome. I yeah, and I got like three D printing. I make all kinds of random weird stuff. So yeah, it's fun. Cool. Well, I mean, if you if you ever want to roll your hobby into like a well-paying career, there's a mm -hmm. lot of jobs out there now. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of companies that you can uh, consult with if you want to talk to me later. Mm -hmm. um, there's companies that will just let you work whatever, like just project based. Yeah. And they're like the middlemen. So mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. You can do that, especially, especially since you have a good grasp of um, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. So. You yeah. could do um, prototypes, and I mean they pay really well. Really? So I'm gonna have to talk later. <laughs> so, I'm gonna yeah. buy 3D printer now. 3D printing's fun. Yeah, I don't know. no, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you if you have those kinds of skills, I know we have mm -hmm. a lot of people out here in Houston that do that. They just work, you know, 20, 30 hours a week, yeah. and they they make good money. So okay, nice. No, that's awesome. Definitely have to dig into this more later on. Um, on the reefing side, I just want to get this where it scrolls away on me. Uh, DM's Reef Tank. He says he got an M1 for his birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, can you tell us more about the pump? So M1, that's the Ecotech Vectra. I have one on my tank. I used to have a J-Bow on my tank, which worked very well. However, one thing I'm throwing out there, I don't know if I'm sensitive to noises, but I'm like obsessed with making my tank ultra silent. Like literally obsessed. Like any noise like that, I'm going to find a way to get rid of it. So you know what else like even my wife like she did not really even hear that she wouldn't hear it but i could hear like a turbine -y sound like even down the hall i could notice it it, it just bugged me so the vectra didn't have that at all like nothing so i went to an lfs and they had him on sale for super cheap he was blowing them out so i'm like okay if i buy this but if it's loud i'm returning it so i took it home it was w it was way quieter so i've i've loved it ever since um it's dc fully controllable if you're using it in your tank for like a closed loop, you can do a lot of cool stuff. Like you count the power heads, all the different wave modes. If you're using it just as a return pump, it's quiet. It's, you know, DC, super efficient. But yeah, for me, super duper duper quiet. So that's a huge plus for me. Uh, one other awesome feature with it is it does have the, the controller has the battery backup plug poured in it. Uh, you, if you want to run off 12 volts, you do need that little battery booster. I think I paid like 25 bucks for it or something. But now I have my return pump and battery backup. So if my power goes out, my return pump is still going to keep flowing. And it, I have a big size battery, so it'll probably, you know, work for the next five days. So not an issue. So I think that part's really awesome with it. 100% um, 100 recommended. I, I think it's an awesome pump. And I'm very strongly considering adding a second one when I get my warranty tank in to potentially have, like, the dual redundancy thing. Uh... <laughs> DC keeps bugging me. Uh, Dev teases with his fancy Voss water holder. Make a video and say I'll make you one DC. Three months waiting. It hasn't been that long. It's been like three weeks. 
Um, so f on that one, my computer, ah, maybe it was a month, but my computer bit the dust and I still have those 3d files, hopefully on a hard drive somewhere. So I got to go dig out all my backups. I had to build a new device. I was using a temporary computer and trying to edit videos and it kept blue screening and I was going crazy, but yes, I still have an old hard drive. I got to dig through. So I will get to that soon. Bug me when I'm back in town after wrap and then I'll see what I can do for you. Um, DN's reef tank. I seen your video on the DIY battery backup. That is very easy to do it, especially if you run Ecotech equipment. 12 volt battery, you can literally wire directly to it. I use a marine trickle charger. If you guys haven't seen it, check my channel. I got some videos on it. Really easy to do. And if you have a decent sized battery, you can keep your tank going for days. So highly, 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 highly recommend it for anything redundancy and just keeping the water and the flow moving in your tank. So that's gonna be a gas exchange and keep everything alive and happy. Uh, seen your video on that. DC, you should buy a positive melody bar. Yeah, pods are expensive. I don't know why, but they are. So I have I culture my own now. I have I have a lot of pod eaters. I like weird little creatures that most people don't have is kind of what I tend to go for. I like trying to find things that are different. But the pipe fish, super cool guys. I don't think I've ever seen them eat frozen food. I think they only eat pods. So make sure I add those weekly to my tank. Um, same with that little spike fin goby. He's super cool, but I don't know if I ever see him actually eat anything. So he, I'm assuming he's surviving on pods. So I keep dumping him in, but super cool little guy. He's slowly coming out more and more and more, but he's still very reclusive, but very cool fish when you actually do see the loose little guy. And if you guys don't do it, pods and phytoplankton, I, I honestly feel there's a ton of benefits of dosing that to the tank. It's one of those oh, yeah natural food. Oh, sorry, I stepped away. I had to go start bubbling in the 120. So <laughs> just keep bubbling. Um, so yeah, it's like if you think about it, pods and phytoplankton are essentially the base of the food chain in the ocean. So you're providing that low level things that's going to have that chain reaction and feed all the different stuff going up in your tank, right? Mm -hmm. So your microfauna and stuff will eat. They'll eat, you know, some of the bacteria are going to eat the phytoplankton, that type of stuff. And so they're going to eat that. They'll grow, you know, maybe amphipods and bigger pods eat the smaller pods, fish and stuff eat those pods. It kind of just works its way up. Corals will eat them as well. Like if I know I spray some pods with a syringe at some of my gargonians, like I'll see those little pulps grab them and eat them right up. So, you yeah. know, I give little squirts my SPS once in a while. Most of the time I just broadcast feed the tank and same thing. I'll yeah. just take a little cup and just dump it all over the place and let it broadcast. But pretty I much put mine, uh, I put mine in at night. Mm -hmm. So I take the bottle yeah. and I just stick the neck of the bottle into the rock somewhere and let them mm -hmm. rip. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, broadcasting, I'm sure works. I'm yep. sure it does. Um, yeah. So who was just saying it? Someone was just saying they feed their pods at night. If you are adding pods to your tank with the intent of seeding it, turn off your lights when you do it or do it at nighttime. Because if you do it with the lights on, your fish have a feeding frenzy and then you probably lose half them right there. Um, ideally, if you turn the flow off and the lights off for a bit and it gives the pods a bit of time to work the way into the rocks different places it's a new tank i usually would recommend you know dump half a bottle or a bottle into your sump if you refuge him ideally and then second would be dump some in your tank too so you just get them all over the place but yeah do it turn off the flow for you know 20 minutes or so turn off the, do it at night when the lights are off and give the little creatures time to work themselves into different places in your tank literally if i do when the lights are on the fish are like feeding friends they just go crazy absolutely yeah, you want them. Uh, you want them to basically have a boom, boom, boom room like Mad Dogs, but in the tank and in the rocks, mm -hmm. um, and then they'll start breeding on their own. No, nope, exactly. The Especially way you do for that is you you can target them, Dev. If you got a long turkey baster, just suck them up in the turkey baster, put it into the rock, and then squeeze them out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. No, exactly. Um, yeah, some, sometimes I do spot feed with it. I mean, the nano, I just broadcast and turn the flow off for half an hour, and then I just see all the pipe fish and everything go crazy. The fairy rats is just like hate eating food and i know a bunch of them get worked into areas but i do that every week or two just to keep all the pot eaters nice and happy right i love how we said someone just mentioned it you have no idea who this is do you maybe <laughs> i'm gonna put it oh right that's on you the in there oh that's, that's you me. oh okay Brother. well your, Thanks. Your, your name I, the chat names don't always match the people names. <laughs> no, that's true enough. That's true yeah. enough. And the thing is, too, I'm usually reading like 10 comments at once. I don't even remember which one read it. I just remember I read this and I need to address it at some point before it strolls away. I don't think that was me in chat, though. No, no? I didn't say chat. Okay. No, so. okay I thought you were, it. you were saying, you know, somebody. Oh, okay. okay. I did now read my, it in the chat. My offense is less taken. Sorry, eh? 
Yeah, you're safe, yay. Uh, no, <laughs> usually I, I read the chat as it's going by and I try and respond. And if I'm in the middle of a conversation, then I try and just keep a mental note to go back to that. I'm like, who said that? Oh, I don't know. Anyways, this is what the point was. This is what I'm supposed to talk about. Exactly. So it's kind of just the oh, mental notes. I did a tip for you. I didn't finish it off. You know, when you were talking about aquascaping with the cement, um, one of the things that we just started doing is not using the cement at all. It started using the silicon. Oh, yeah? And what we do then is we crush up some of the uh, rock and once the silicon is in place and it's it's starting to cure, hmm. we sprinkle the uh, rock dust over it to hide so it. So you can't even see it. Yeah. So That's it interesting way of doing it. Stuck together. That's hmm. neat. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the reasons I went that way was because, uh, like you were saying about uh, sucking the oxygen out when mm -hmm. we're doing big scapes and we have to um, construct the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that was my issue was that we it was such a big scape you can't cycle it, or you can't soak it. So mm -hmm. what we did was we used the silicon and said it worked really well. So ah, maybe for... something you might want to try out. Very cool. No, it's good. Good one for future. Maybe I'll try that on a future mm -hmm. tank. Uh, look over no, everywhere. So I think we've pretty much covered most of the redundancy stuff. I am going to head her fairly soon. So I guess just the last little bit for whatever the talk. I have to wake up at like three in the morning to get up and go to an airport in another city and get to start so this what journey. What place do your tank then that will you be in a way? Um, my tank's pretty much self-sufficient. I'm obviously going to bribe the wife to feed it. Probably put in, a, thank you for the reminder, put in a fresh filter sock for today. Uh, yeah. Aside from that, I mean, everything's really automated in my tank. I checked. This is bad. No one knows this. Um, so I haven't tested. I realized I looked at my chart for recording all my dosing, and I haven't tested my tank in almost two months, my big tank. Right. And my elk and everything was not too far off. It was pretty much right on. So it's pretty good for not testing for two months, which is terrible. You should test weekly. Uh, <laughs> but it just made me happy that everything was pretty much in check still, despite how long it's been since I've tested it. The Nano's getting more attention on the testing. The big tank I've been slacking. But everything's growing. is happy, so... You can get away a little bit more. Webcam, so you can check on it while you're away. No, I have not. Watch your babies. I have not. I just have to hope for the best. <laughs> but should be good. I still, I, one of these okay. days, I want to find an underwater camera. I think it'd be cool to have one in the tank. Oh, you want They're one? out there. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. mm, I might have one for you, Dad. Really? Let me know, Nick. Okay, I got a cute smart one, though. Yeah. If you want to look at it. Okay. I think about $250, something like that. Send me a... Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, uh, there's one that uh, For... that we like, Dev, that's an underwater camera. And it's the uh, Olympus Targus. Uh, I believe it's a TG4. That's a, is that like a photography camera? It's a photography yeah. one that also has video. Okay. Uh, I was yeah, thinking... I got it. As well. That one actually, I have a buddy that has one. It takes amazing underwater macros too. But um, I'm thinking of one more of like a web camera. Because if you have one. Yeah, the they have one that you can get that's only a couple of hundred dollars that you can connect to Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's what, when we go to Colorado, I'm thinking about when we have a house sitter feeding my fish and everything. Yeah. I'm thinking about just connecting one of those as almost like a nanny cam for my fish. I was just going to say nanny cam for the fish, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. but, it, but it'll be underwater and I can put it on one side. I mean, mm -hmm. it's... It's mostly just so I can kind of keep track, mm -hmm. but it, it also, I can tie it into my security system in my house mm -hmm. because my security system is Wi-Fi, so yeah. it can record. So if, so I can even kind of go back and be like, oh, you forgot to feed the fish <laughs> without, without being too intrusive. I can yeah. just be like, oh, you know. Why don't you take my clownfish out and smack it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. Uh, I think the one I've got is called the Q Smart. That if you want to look it up, it's that that actually the, sounds familiar. Yeah, that's Q Smart. Okay, I'll check it out later. Uh, Q Smart. Is it waterproof? Like you can submerge it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's got a magnet that you stick onto the side of the glass. Oh, it's here. Okay. Yeah, it's called the Smart. There's also the uh, the Robo Snail camera as well. Does that work well? I I've looked no, at those. It's a couple thousand dollars as well. Are you kidding? Not... <laughs> oh, that's sketchy. I would be worried that it would scratch my glass and like catch sand or something. I'd be paranoid about that. <laughs> like that Robo Scraper. Remember, well, that was a thing for a while. Did you guys ever see that? 
Yeah, I've seen it yeah, online. For the guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Come on, how lazy you gotta be. Yeah. If, I heard it was really loud. QI. Yeah. It, it was. Yep. I actually saw it in action. Yeah. Ah, that's kind of cool. So this one, you can it's on Wi-Fi, and then you can actually move the camera as well. Oh, very cool. So Ooh. you see the little, you see the little ball. Yeah, I like it. That goes from side to side. How physically big is it? Is it huge or is it fairly small? Uh, it's a little bit large, but I think uh, for what it does, mm -hmm. I, I tried it out before launch. The company sent it to me before yep. they launched it. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, pre-launch model. Okay. Uh, it shoots fish food too, right? <laughs> Does that one? No, I'm serious. Doesn't that one shoot like pit fish pellet food or something? Yeah, that's right. It shoots. It's it's almost like a dog treat. <laughs> like... So if I put it next to my flipper magnet, mm -hmm. oh, you can't see it very well. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty big, but okay. No, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. So you can see mm -hmm. but when it goes on, it's like this. Yeah. Okay. But um. For what you want to do with it, I guess it's all right. Mm -hmm. For holidays, you're not going to be there, right? So you, it doesn't matter how big it is. Yeah. You know I mean? No, exactly. I was I was half thinking, oh, and it's broken. Ah, <laughs> easy come, easy go. <laughs> that doesn't work. Mm. No. I, Cheap, wet yeah. I have a Raspberry Pi camera just hanging out doing nothing. So I was thinking about maybe trying I, that and build a little. I was going to ask. I was going to ask earlier if, since you're into like Arduino and all that, mm -hmm. if you've decided to do, they have a wreath, I want to call it like wreathberry pie or something. Wreath pie, I think. A friend of, a yep. friend of mine is one of the, um, one of the editors for Make Magazine and he interviewed the company. Mm -hmm. He said they haven't really gone anywhere with the project though. Um, like they haven't really expanded on it. Yeah. But, um, but uh, Chris Craft is the name of the person who did the write-up on it, uh, okay. if you want to look it up. Okay. I have heard of that one. Um, I haven't tried it. I did start building a Raspberry, or not Raspberry, Arduino one way back in the day, which worked pretty well for just kind of like controlling. And what timing. What all did you do? Like, oh, okay. So it was just like timing and yeah, all that. Yeah. Like, like it can arms. Um, so it had like a heater controller to control like the outlets for that. Um, I had a fish feeder hooked up so it'd feed the fish. Um, like all the power outlets were controlled based off like timing or whatever you want to do with that. There's that type of stuff like heater fail safes and that's kind of the main stuff I wanted with it. It's controllable outlets. <laughs> Could people donate to your stream to shoot pellets at the fish? <laughs> That'd be awesome. That'd be kind of fun. Um, so a friend of mine, her name is Renee, not, not again, but like, but she, she does that. She has people that pay money to shoot her with ping pong balls really? on a website and yeah. with robots. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you I'll send you a link later, okay. Nick, through your Facebook and you can pass it around. I don't want to put it through here. It's through a website. She and I both build robots yeah. for the website. Yeah. But yeah, people get to pay ten cents to shoot her with ping pong balls throughout the day. She makes over six hundred dollars a month just off people shooting her with ping pong balls. That's while, awesome. while she's working in her workshop. It's oh, pretty sweet. That's awesome. So uh, I was laughing. So Calconaut was saying, could could people donate to your Twitch stream to shoot pellets? It's probably doable. However, the tank would probably crash if too many people did it. And it's just putting obscene amounts of food into your tank. You'd have to have some kind of a daily limit on that one. <laughs> yeah. the at One of my malls, they have something like that where you can pay. There's a huge tank. Yeah. And it says you can pay to feed the fish. And I was wondering about that. Like, they've got to have a limiter on it. Because if a bunch of people go, yeah, like, mm -hmm. do you go up there, put in a dollar, and then it, like, doesn't drop food because too many people have fed the fish? It's like, wah, wah. <laughs> I don't know. Or it's, like, plastic pellets fall in, and you're like, wait a minute. That's not real food. Why aren't they eating it? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. But, yeah, I think that could be dangerous if people were malicious and decided to spend lots of money to, like, nitrate the heck out of your tank. <laughs> no, I think you just have it on certain times, right? That's true. That's true. Could do it. Could be fun. Oh, I have a random question. Has, has anyone tried doing multiple YouTube streams at the same time? No. No? Okay. I'm just curious if you could or not. You mean from one account or from separate accounts? From one account. Um, so one account streaming to two different... Multiple streams. Like, live streams. Multiple streams? I know you can I know you can stream out to two different things. Like, I can, I can stream to Twitch and, like, mm -hmm. you can stream to multiple platforms. Okay. If I, that's what you... 
Yeah, no, I know you could do that. I thought about trying to do a tamp camera for fun, but I was curious if I had it live and I still want to do a live stream on top of that, if it would work. I might just like try Like if one someone day. has your key, maybe because they're distinct keys, maybe you could have two at once. Yeah, that's what I was you thinking. You know what? You know what? I have done that by Ooh, accident. It works? I start, well, by accident, I had a live stream going and I couldn't mm -hmm. end it because the button was disabled. <laughs> ah. So I started the live stream that I intended. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can do that. Okay. So I just had to go make the other one private. Okay, so, fair. yes, you can do two streams at once. Okay, good to know. This, all these, like, fish tank cameras, I was thinking about trying to do something fun with that. We'll see. Could be some you, future project. Do you project. use OBS? Yep. Cause, okay, because you do the green screen. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, yeah, you could just, like, you know, do side by side. Because for my podcast, we do OBS. And okay. I'm going to have, I've already thought about it. I'm going to have, like, a feed to my tank, probably, like, the internal mm -hmm. webcam. Like, yep. we, like Nick was just mentioning. Mm-hmm that up on the tank and then like myself talking about whatever's happening yeah so. yeah usually when there's not people on the tank it's the same thing i guess pulled up the tank one if you're i don't know if you're watching youtube but sometimes i'll do that and throw the tank behind me rather than there's people yeah. on there that's good to mix it up that's common yeah mm -hmm. or i could just keep joining live streams and talk about how one day i'm gonna make a video about my roof tank there you go people don't believe you have one until you actually make a video it's all theory yeah <laughs> ah, you showed it earlier you're safe <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think I'm going to kill the live stream and we can just hang on hangouts for a few, but, um, thanks everyone that joined today. Hopefully that gave everyone that's on lots of good ideas for stuff of kind of fail safe in your tank. If anyone is going to Reefapalooza, make sure you come find me and say hi. And otherwise I'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks everybody who joined. And if you enjoyed this, and hit that like button. Reefer Madness mentioned that he's going to be starting a live stream. Perfect. After this if you guys want to go join it. Yeah. So. If you guys need your fix, you know where to go. Reefer Madness channel. Okay. Reefer Madness. Thanks.